back at our traditional time but we are back nonetheless and yes. this, this definitely yeah this definitely wasn't a cobbled together show at the last minute at all <laughs> wednesday it looks a lot like thursday if you squint like it's well, like, it, eh. i think we're just embracing the whole midweek drinking thing and you know, i'm perfectly fine with this uh no thank you everyone for joining us for this tonight it's not our normal night but uh i'm not going to be here tomorrow i'm going to be flying my way out to houston for anime matsuri and um, i only realized this about two nights ago when i was on a stream with mauler and movie cynic um and so yeah we we came upon this solution we'll just do open bar on a wednesday instead this week because we didn't want to miss two weeks in a row did we that just wouldn't be acceptable mm. um, people come after us yeah. So yeah, last week I was off um, jetting off to Canada to oversee Rogue Elements, which was filming. So it's currently filming right now, actually, and it's Ooh. very cool. So yeah, um, the glamorous life of a YouTuber. <laughs> so, uh, mostly it was just um, standing around and getting bitten by mosquitoes because, man, they're brutal out there. But well, yeah, hey, it was it good happens. fun. Hmm. Have you seen like these videos that go viral of people torturing them? I, I fully support that. <laughs> I fully support. It's like to get those psychopathic tendencies out of you, you know. I mean, I would never condone violence against animals or anything, but like mosquitoes are a different breed. So it was one. Of, <laughs> it was one that was fucking nuts. Some guy had constructed like wooden saw traps, but for mosquitoes. <laughs> Brilliant human ingenuity, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, our creativity knows no bounds when it comes to inflicting torture, but. Uh... Yay. Hey ho! But anyway, we're here and we've got a bunch of stuff to talk about tonight. So I guess we should dive right in and bring our guests in. What do you reckon? I think so, sir. Let's do it. All right. Well, making her return to the open bar. She seems far too classy for an establishment like this, but uh, we let her in anyway. It is the one and only baggage claim. Hello <laughs> and welcome back. Hi. Hello, Jen. So I'm always happy to be grabbing a drink with you guys. Excellent. Yeah, Howdy. your your place looks way too tidy for the open bar. Like, <laughs> can't accept this. It's too classy. Yeah, like ten minutes ago, I was moving from side to side and picking up all the clutter. Ah, there we like go. Yeah, it's all just out of frame. Yeah. It's out of frame. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like a pile right there. <laughs> yeah, uh, but no, thank you for coming back on for this. I know it was fairly short notice, so I appreciate it. All good. Cool. Uh, all right, our next guest is, he is a legend in the Star Trek community and, well, the movie review community in general. Um, he knows more about Trek than I'll ever know, so uh, it's a pleasure to have him on, as always, Mr. Robert Meyer Burnett. Welcome back, my friend. Always, always a pleasure to be here, and, you know, I know it's the open bar, but I promise you I'm sober today. Waller, I wanted to <laughs> apologize for you. Boo! I know, I know, you know, just wanted to make that clear. Drunk Rob is the best Rob. I don't know about that. <laughs> no, thanks for coming in for this, man. I appreciate it. Thanks for asking. Cool. Um, and last up, we have got... Um, he hijacked his way into this stream because he was on when we were chatting about this with Movie Cynic the other night. Uh, and, well, um, this is the second time, I think, on the open bar, but it's definitely good to have him back. It is Dark Hour. Hey, welcome back, man. Yeah, second time on open bar, third time on the channel. That's nice. Yeah, it wasn't that long ago you were on, actually, yeah. Uh, about two months ago, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Back then. Um, well, we, I think um, back then you were still on just a few hundred subscribers. Now you're like two and a half thousand. So you're doing yeah. pretty, pretty well. I'm, I'm trying. You know, it's a, I'm not quitting my job anytime soon, though. That's all. It's, it's yeah. a long way to go until that. But you, you'll get there. Give it a few more thousand. <laughs> Thank you for having me on again, though. No, I get to have you back, man. Um, yeah. Well, I, I guess um, I was kind of looking at the, the things that we've got on our roster tonight. Um, the first one, I just thought it would be nice for a bit of light entertainment, really. Uh, obviously, you know, um, SAG, the the um, the Writers Guild, everyone's on strike at the moment in Hollywood, and a lot of the, the big Hollywood celebrities are joining the picket lines to share their thoughts mm. on, on the current situation. And um, 
not least of which was Rachel Zegler, the, the upcoming star of Snow White. Um, I'm go I was going to call it Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, but it's not anymore. It's, I don't know, Snow White and the Magical Forest People or something. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> oh, Seven diverse characters. Yeah. But, you know, she shared her thoughts on what she believes that she deserves as an actor. So let's, let's hear what she has to say, I guess. Mm. 18 hours in a dress of an iconic Disney princess. I deserve to be paid for every hour that it is streamed online. So, um, yeah, she caught up a little bit of flack for this because I, I think perhaps she's misunderstanding why these actors are on strike. Um, when you're when you're headlining a major Disney movie, um, you're already making millions of dollars. Um, you're not in the same boat as um, day player actors who are living paycheck to paycheck and who are literally going to have to um, sell their houses um, it, in order to get through this strike period. Um, but yeah, it, it kind of came down to a little bit of um, it's all about me. Um, and she's copped a lot mm. of um, criticism for saying this. And I think I, I think it's justified in a lot of ways because she didn't really need to take this tack with it. She could have just said, I'm here in solidarity with my fellow actors and I just want to support them. But to say, like, yeah, I deserve more. You know, you're you're already starring in a, a major Disney production, and you know, as much as Disney might be a, a brand that's in decline a little bit right now, uh, it still puts you in the top zero point one percent of all actors ever um, to be in that position. So, felt a little bit ungrateful, I guess. Uh, I don't worth, know what you guys um, think about. Is it worth just quickly repeating a quote, just in case anybody didn't understand it? Uh, I will do it again. No, not like, I mean, as in, like, you say it. <laughs> Instead, oh, you want me to say it, yeah. So if I'm going to be standing there for 12 hours a day uh, in a dress as a Disney princess, or an iconic Disney princess, then I deserve to be paid for every hour that this streams online. So anytime mm. someone streams it, she deserves more money, um, which I'm pretty sure is not how actress contracts work. You don't get paid that kind of residual. Um, but yeah, yeah. Um, I, I would have more sympathy if this was, um, say, a stuntman or something who risks life and limb to do what they do, um, or, or someone who's really taken on a grueling, difficult role. Um, but it's like, I, I wore a dress for a while, uh, so I deserve loads of more money than the millions I'm already making. Hey, if anyone forces me to wear a dress, know. I'm going to be asked to be paid for that. <laughs> I don't know. I could, I could get into <laughs> it. <laughs> if it was a Snow White she's dress. Literally, she's literally starring in the movie. I mean, it's it's no one even knew who this girl was like a month ago, right? Until all the photos got leaked and the ridiculous photos, of course. But I, I find it this, between this and that interview she did with Gal Gadot, where, you know, it, it's just this combination of massive smugness. And I feel like she's doing her best to just destroy her career before it even begins. It's just, it's not, it's so unpalatable. She's definitely not endearing herself to to audiences and yeah like you say that that interview with gal gadot that was actually made months ago and it's weird how these things just come to light later mm. and then they start getting quite widely True. shared but again she seemed to take real pleasure in this idea that they were deconstructing the whole mythos of of what snow white was as a classic fairy tale and i just thought well you're you're losing the very essence of what the story was you know that that's it's it's a hell of a yeah. thing to say like we're going to take this um, this iconic fairy tale that was basically the the bedrock of what Disney was built on as an animation studio uh, and trash it because it's outdated now. Um, oh, someone's someone's drag racing in the background by the sounds of things. Um, so yeah, to say that and and take real pleasure in it didn't exactly endear herself off the bat. And then yeah, you get something like this. It's um, I don't know, man. I know that like when you get a young actor who suddenly gets thrust into the limelight and elevated to this much higher position. Um, sometimes all the attention and the power can kind of go to their heads and they end up saying things that they, they probably shouldn't, you know, unwise stuff. I don't know if that's just a, a part of what we're seeing here. Maybe she's just, uh, she's not used to this kind of media attention and she doesn't realize that when you say stuff like that, it's either going to be taken out of context or it's going to be very closely listened to. And you've got to be very careful about what you say. I'm not sure. Well, you know, I think what's interesting, I think you're right about she's very new to the business. And she started out in a big way working for Spielberg as the lead uh, in West Side Story. 
And then she was in Shazam Fury of the Gods. Now she's going to be in um, the Hunger Games prequel and then Snow White. So she's been thrust into very high profile projects for very high profile production entities. And I can understand how you can get captivated by that. But I think if you're going to go on to the picket line and obviously people are going to point cameras at you, you should become educated about how the business works. And you need to understand the economics. Not all streaming services are the same. Uh, not all productions are the same. You have to understand the structure of how the business works. And that's always helpful for everybody who, especially when you're out there picketing against you know, your corporate minders, you need to know exactly what you're fighting and how you're fighting for it. So it's never a good thing when you don't. Um, yeah, like uh, you're very right um, when you say like you need to understand how the business works, particularly if you're in the business. <laughs> yeah, like, <laughs> it would help. I mean, especially uh, when she said something like, "I should get paid for every moment that it's streaming." That's a nice idea, but the the reason people get paid is because there used to be a model that has changed. Um, that programming was paid for by advertisers. So you had money constantly coming in based on how many people watched and it was all measurable and identifiable and that's how you got your residuals. Well, what's happening now is, say, for instance, on Netflix, there is none of that. And Netflix might make 100 shows and two or three of them become huge successes. So, And everybody thinks that Netflix should be paying out all of these residuals. The thing is they don't have an ad-based revenue stream. And it's very different. So what are the residuals? How do you yeah. identify? How, how, do, how, how do the actors expect or SAG expect Netflix to pay out residuals? Because there isn't that economic model that even exists for Netflix. Whereas when Netflix buys Friends, for instance, for another year in 2019, Netflix paid $100 million to run Friends for a year. So... That the, where does that hundred million dollars go? Well, Netflix doesn't own Friends, so they don't owe any money to anybody except the people that do own Friends, which is Warner Brothers and the production companies that made Friends. Now it's up to those production companies to distribute that hundred million dollars the way it has been previously negotiated to be distributed. That was found money for all involved, so everybody got a nice chunk of change in 2019 from Netflix but not from Netflix. They got it from the production companies that profited off making friends in the first place. So people need to understand all this before they start, you know, maybe giving quotes on the red carpet or on the strike lines. Hmm. Uh, to, uh, to piggyback off that, I mean, I, she doesn't even, when it, like, not only does she not understand the business end, she doesn't seem to even understand the concept of like general economics when like you know there's there's a you know everybody's familiar with you know hourly rate salary everybody a lot of people have dealt with that but then there's also contract you know you you agree to this and this is what you get and you can't like you have you would have to go back to the table and renegotiate for your next contract you can't just do it by screaming and that's essentially how that works uh you know most people most people don't work in a contract situation but the ones who do actors and people of that nature should be educated on how that process works completely. And it, it's, it's the same across various contracted, uh, you know, industries, but it's, it, it, she's not working an hourly job or even a salary job. She, she did what she was asked to do, which was act in, or I guess it's being filmed now, but when you're asked to act in the film, once you're done with that portion, your section is done. The rest right. of it is all, it's no longer part of, what you negotiated unless there's some residuals and stuff in there, but you've, you've completed your task and they've completed their payment. That's the next contract for your next job is, is what, how it works. That's yeah. all I have. To add. <laughs> no, no, but that's actually, that's actually true. And in those, I always say on my channel, you don't get what you deserve. You get what you negotiate. And the thing is Hollywood contracts can be Byzantine and labyrinthian in terms of how, big they can be but you know you get you get tv rights you get streaming rights you get physical media rights all of that is pre-negotiated it's all in your contract 
So when Rachel Ziegler gets a job playing Snow White or playing Marie in West Side Story, she's very aware. She knows exactly what she's going to be getting. And and it's it's not a surprise. Now, there has to be accountability. Um, and things have changed because, especially in television and streaming, there is not the accountability that there used to be, which is what the actors are fighting for. And I'm 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 a big proponent of that because people are making a lot of money. But also the streamers are losing billions of dollars right now because the economic model that they were following, they were they, they basically got into an arms race and they're spending a ton of money making content. But that content is not monetized the way it used to be. So what's fascinating to me is if you look at like Disney Plus, I had no idea just how many shows they're just dumping. They're, they're making movies direct to Disney Plus films that were being made or acquisitions. They picked up some movies from Turkey that they put them on their streaming service and no one knows they're there. So they don't perform well. And then Disney just dumps these movies from their service never be heard from again and this is terrifying for anybody that spends their days trying to make content I'm trying to make movies they'll, do you think they'll dump snow white onto disney plus instead of releasing it theatrically i don't you know that's a real i'm really fascinated by this because again why you know you look at something like the lion king the live action version is a pretty slavish devotion uh, devoted version to the original i mean it's pretty it's pretty there's a lot of fealty between the the Favreau version and then the original animated version, which I, you know, I think that's what people want. And I can say things like I loved Kenneth Branagh's adaptation of Cinderella. I, I was taking that. I'm like, I don't, why would I ever want to go see a live action Cinderella movie? But Kenneth Branagh, I'm a fan of, I mean, I remember going seeing, seeing Henry V, his first live action movie that he directed coming from the Royal Shakespeare company. And he made a Cinderella movie that I actually found enchanting. Plus it had, Lily James in it, which didn't hurt as Cinderella. But but I watched that film and I'm like, this is a pretty good movie. I, I and I walked in primed to dislike it because it it kept the essence of the story. It kept that essence of the Cinderella tale. And I look at Snow White and I'm like, mm. I mean, I'm gonna I'm gonna reserve judgment till we see more. But I'm like, what is this movie now supposed to be about? I was kind of hoping it was gonna be a time bandits type of a film. Like I just recently picked up time bandits on 4k and I love that movie. You know, um, David Rappaport, who was a, a little person leading the time bandits. And there's this great troop of actors in that film. And I figured if there's a, if there's a time bandits vibe to snow white, it could be really good. Hmm. Well, that was quickly. Those hopes were dashed in yeah. those pictures. And I'm like, what are you, what are you making here? What are you trying to do here? And how did how did you spend like $150 million on this to look this bad? I, I, I don't Definitely know. It wasn't on the costume budget, that's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and it's funny because Time Bandits is a pretty delightful movie. You know, Yeah, Terry I remember Gilliam. it being quite, quite good fun. Yeah. It's a lot of fun, you know, and I figured maybe Snow White could be like that. Um, I guess not. While we're, while we're talking here, the um, Disney quarterly earnings report is coming out, like Bob Iger's presenting it. Uh, there's a few highlights that have come through already. Um, apparently, in terms of revenue, uh, they were, they've come in at $22.3 billion, which is slightly below expectations. Um, and Disney Plus subscribers have declined for the second quarter in a row. Uh, they were expected 151 million. Mm. They're now sitting at 146, so they're five million below expectations. Mm. You tell me which... it didn't go up in anticipation of Secret Invasion? I know. I'm as shocked as you are. I really am. But um, yeah, I guess that's that's um, the trend. That they're on now and i don't know how they break out of it because i don't think they've got any killer movies or shows coming out on disney plus that are really going to drive people back to that app uh, or that streaming service it kind of feels like i don't know not that they're locked into a terminal decline but i just i don't know what they can possibly offer people that will that will bump them back up again and turn it around well their strategy failed their strategy was that Originally, the, and it was, went against what they said. Their original, originally, they said, "Oh, you don't need to have this service to follow these big these big franchises," 
And then they took, they immediately took that back. Now ever you have to, then it had to be, you have to see all the Marvel shows to understand the MCU. You have to watch the star Wars shows because that's all we have left. And, you know, cause they haven't, they haven't made a movie in since when at this point, 2019, and, yeah, 2019. So their strategy mm-hmm. kind of backfired because it, pissed people off that they were lied to first of all that's number one number two they made crap content uh and number three they they started losing contracts so it was it essentially their entire like smoke and mirror show that they were building uh, uh, around disney plus just is is bottoming out at this point yep uh, their share price has dropped two percent already uh in light of these reports so it's down at uh, 87 dollars a share at the moment which is pretty rough like i don't know if there's a floor to to their share um but um yeah 87 dollars is pretty damn low i mean that's uh, they were up at like 150 or something at one point weren't they there's always yeah. a floor to every share it's called zero yeah <laughs> that's true <laughs> yeah. i mean they did things too that this seems silly to say but disney did not renew its rights to their cricket programming that's what I meant by they, yeah. they, they lost contracts. Which, that's yeah, in that India. Yeah. That was a I massive, mean, massive loss. Yeah, that was a huge loss. And it's it, it's like when you're developing a streaming service, Disney can't just rely on its back catalog or its its latest franchises because there's not enough programming coming in. But something like cricket, I mean, we in America here we n- might not be as familiar with it, um, but all over the world, cricket is hugely popular in, in places huge. like India. And and in Australia, New Zealand, the UK, and to lose something like that, especially for a population like India, that's a monster hit to your service. Yeah. And why mm-hmm. would you allow that to happen? I mean, I presume they were outbid or something because they must they have been aware of how Fox. important it was. Yeah, like Fox Sports, obviously not Fox. But... Yeah, but... Um, I'm just looking at their like. See if you were an investor in Disney, right? Like, there's a, a nice little um, table that gives you what you would expect to earn on your investment. So, um, in 2019, you would get a 34 percent increase, which is amazing. What year uh, was 20, that? Uh, 2019. Okay. Uh, 2020, you get 25 percent increase. Uh, 2021 uh, minus 14 percent, which is kind of understandable. You know, it was the pandemic kicking in. Like, um, everything was uh, was volatile at that point. Uh, then you get to 2022, it was minus 42.9%. Ooh. Yeah. That is horrific. <laughs> Imagine if you were an investor with like billions of dollars on the line and that's what you were getting. Jeez. Um, and this year it's kind of bottoming out at the moment anyway. It's like minus 2%. So I don't know what it's going to be in light of yeah, the earnings report. But You would think that 2021 would have actually been a better year coming out of the pandemic because that's what they were still like they were still dumping things on on the service so like things that you had you had to watch the service for you know for disney plus so people would have had to buy it number two people were going back to work you would think that they would have been like okay i'll keep this streaming service you know it got me through you know the pandemic or whatever i'm not gonna like so there, you'd think that it wouldn't have been a huge drop off with disney plus but it seems like there was I mean, I think the the parks were operating operating at a reduced capacity, so that really hurt them financially. Um, and yeah, I, I, yeah, I can only assume like this year because they've had massive flops at the box office. You know, Indiana Jones that's that's lost hundreds of millions of dollars at mm. the the box office. Like that has got to factor into it too. Mm. I mean, that's that's awful, but. Yeah, that's what's coming out so far about the earnings report. Uh, I guess we'll get more news as it carries on. Um, and hey. Secret Invasion ended up being like the second lowest ever watched, right? Something, something abysmal the like that. The lowest rated, I think. So, like, I think that's just in terms of audience scores. Um, oh, got it. Mueller might be able to correct me on that one. I think it was uh, one of the lowest watched shows they ever did. I think it was the lowest watched uh, Marvel show. I think that's yeah, how which okay. I assume we can all just buy that. We don't even need like really because it's just been declining. Everyone's interest, everyone's because it's funny. I think was it Doc? I was bringing up how um, we're going to need to watch all of these shows to know the context of something like the Marvels, yeah. which is hilarious, by the way. Like, why would yeah. people don't even want to see it, let alone have to see these other things? But it's simultaneously, and it, it sounds like a contradiction, but you need to see these shows to carry on. But also, these shows don't feel like they're a part of a universe. You watch them and they just feel superfluous. It's like you've literally managed to crack the worst of both worlds. They don't feel connected, but they so feel like important to watch if, if con- you don't understand anything. 
and it's so it's like connected and if it is connected it's so convoluted that it's very hard to follow yeah right like with secret invasion some it's a, i mean it's a small thing but it just it's like adds to the confusion that um Rhodes, you know is is a decoy he's and you find out that he's potentially was a decoy since civil war civil war yeah so yeah. You, yeah, so it's like, it's so strange that you're going back and you're editing everything that happened in the past. It's impossible to connect anything anymore. Because they're not paying attention. I've watched, to I think, they're... everything, and I'm I'm still confused. I've literally watched every show, and I'm very confused about where the act the universe is at. I, to I be fair, I watch it a lot itself. while I'm cleaning my bathroom, so it's impossible to actually pay attention. Man, What's they, they, that's uh, You have to have a really dirty bathroom then, because they put out shit all the time for this. <laughs> well, yeah, the right. every time. I have a really clean bathroom. I think it's the opposite. Yeah. What's interesting too is if you go back and you watch, you go back to the era of say Winter Soldier and, and you watch the films that surrounded it, they really worked well. And there was a lot of excitement there. And they the the feeling, I don't know if, how, how can I explain it, but the the feeling that the like I really as a huge I'm a huge fan of the 23 uh films that make up the infinity saga. I thought for the most oh, yeah. part they did a really great job. Even when things were just good, it still there was still a, a magic to it, it, and you felt like there was a forward narrative thrust. And you know, you you get to Infinity War. That movie is wildly entertaining, and I, I I remember thinking, I can't believe that I'm I'm watching this movie with all of these characters together as a somebody who grew up reading comics, and it was just so fun to watch, and nothing that has come from Marvel has a spark to it. And I'm fascinated by, I, I, I think someone's got to write a monograph that I need to read that, that maybe Mahler can explain why this doesn't work. It, it, I mean, overall, the whole universe doesn't work. It's almost well, as like I'm looking at a universe that's died. I'll try and do mm. this in under an hour. Um, <laughs> you have five uh, minutes more. <laughs> Because I'm with Robert entirely on, on, on Infinity War, and it's like, why did Infinity War happen? It's like, well, the big realization we have in Endgame is that Infinity War is like a direct consequence of Civil War, that the Avengers broke apart and they couldn't take on Thanos. They could have beaten him together, you know, that sort of thing. Why did Civil War happen? Well, because of Age of Ultron and Winter Soldier, uh, you mm -hmm. know, Cap's distrust in the networks and the individuals more important, plus uh, everything Ka uh, Iron Man and the team did to stop Ultron and all the consequences of that and creating it. Why did those films happen? It's like, well, you can draw back, draw back, draw back. Even in um, Avengers, right, you, you, it draws from Thor that the Asgardians and their control over Earth, you know, the, the tensions of that. If you remember, Thor's big issue is like, if Earth wants to actually enter the fight of like all planets and stuff, it's dangerous and you need to understand the consequences. Uh, Cap is having trouble because he's like, I, I, I agree with everything S.H.I.E.L.D. does in the government. And then Iron Man is like, why? And points out loads of these things that aren't, it's not the same as when we were fighting the Nazis sort of thing. And that's, that's his sort of mm -hmm. stuff. And then Iron Man, of course, being Iron Man and, uh, you know, he's, he's, he's causing conflict with almost everybody because he wants to have control. What I'm trying to say is that all of those films support and inform Avengers. It makes Avengers a complete package. It could have fucking ended the MCU at Avengers, to be honest with you. And it would have been kind of neat. It would have been like, there you go. Um, I agree with you. It would have been a perfect days, series, honestly. The, these days, uh, you have... In uh, it, this happens every time, but like in Quantum Mania, right? They've cracked so many forms of technology that are incredible that I think it would change the world forever. But no other films know about that. Same goes, and you know, I know it, it was much more popular and stuff. But Guardians Three, they introduced those uh, instant heal packs. It's like, can we get those to Earth? That would be incredible. The the effects would have. You go over to Wakanda Forever, that they, they've got insane technology and. Um, same for like Shang Chi with his rings or um, Multiverse of Madness. You've got all these spells, and it's just like, does anyone know anybody exists anymore? Does anyone take care? when when in Secret Invasion they were like, this is the president? I was like, is it? Who's that? I don't know. Is he, right. he going to be relevant in other episodes? <laughs> the things? Does anyone else know? And then like, is any other project going to acknowledge the scrolls? I don't know. And then you have the uh, what Baggage Claim was talking about. All these other projects that made. Rhodey have meaningful moments. That's all he's ever gotten in the mm. MCU, and they took all of them away, just in in a in a moment. When you when you mm. thought, oh man, look at Rhodey like looking after Tony there as he's dying. It's like that's not Rhodey. That's a that's a female scroll. It's like yeah. what? You Why guys you really didn't stop everything. to think about the implications of this. Yeah. And it that's, makes that's them, it right there. It's, it's that it's, no one's it, thinking. There's no investment. Why mm. would I want to see what happens next anymore? Um. What's the point? 
because uh, you, know, you, 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 you summed like, it up very you, you just you know it's funny i never quite had it codified my mind you just nailed it and you're mm-hmm. you're absolutely right and it, it's funny like how do they not know that you know it's i think of all the shows when i watched it was hawkeye that made me realize i'm like why am i watching i understand it was an adaptation of a matt faction story <laughs> why but am I'm i like, watching this <laughs> what, what i was watching i'm watching this and i'm like what does this have to do i know it was based on a comic run but i'm like why is hawkeye here he could solve this problem in in 30 minutes and we're wandering around new york and he's not with his family it's christmas time i'm no one was i'm like why are you why don't you all get into a room and have a conversation this could all be over right now and it mm. was it was this there, I, I still don't know and i've even read the comic run what they were hoping to achieve by that adaptation other than you know introducing us to kate bishop and p- potentially the young avengers but none of it matters what about how humanity would be forever altered after realizing thanos could it, that there could be another entity that could snap you away Mm-hmm. How would that affect the religions of the world? It's like nobody seems to care. Eh, whatever. Yeah. Well, that, there's, oh, there's, there's so yeah. many aspects to it, but yeah, like um, Irish and the Judge, they're celestial. Eh, whatever. Yeah. I'm gonna go to church on Sunday. To to yeah, to pick up on the point, like why why did they make that show? I think a lot of it was just we need stuff. We just need more yeah. content for Disney Plus, and yeah. it's like, well, okay, Hawkeye's available. The actor's available. Let's just do a TV show with him. Fine, yeah. you know, it eats up more space. Um, but yeah, like people in chat keep referencing the giant celestial that's like poking halfway out of the, the ocean <laughs> up into the atmosphere. Never gets mentioned again. The and Marvel keeps saying, we like, oh, is the- we're gonna we're gonna deal with it, don't worry. And it's like, yeah, but you don't care, do you? You wish everyone would just forget about it. Like if nobody was talking about it on social media or, or message boards or anything, you would never deal with it again. You would quite happily She-Hulk forget about it. Made fun of it. That's all we've got. She Hulk yeah, had a little it. article that said, "Like this guy sticking out of the earth." By the way, it's like I mean, wouldn't yeah. every geologist say that. Earth was this close to ending? Yeah, if this thing yeah. had fully emerged, the Earth would have cracked in half and exploded. I feel like well, everyone should be say, like, imagine, we don't know what yeah. it means. Yeah, imagine the the That's mass also- terror that would grip the population, knowing that like there's giant robotic gods like lurking within our planet. There's like entities out there in the universe that could snap us out of existence at any moment. You can't There's... actually trust that anyone isn't a shape shifting alien now. Yep. Yeah, friggin' Galactus could come along and just eat us. Like your, oh, computer, your, your computer could Please. turn come alive and just take over the world. Please, a cat could know. turn into a giant tentacle monster thing that could like <laughs> murder your entire family. Like, well, and yeah, remember, you would never, you would, you would be scarred for life. Does this. anybody but you know what they like... keep referencing though over and over is the avengers like every show or movie references back to the avengers but they never reference one. to there each other one, no. yeah and the, it's What's, always they go team? back to the 2019 stuff yeah does, does anybody remember does anybody remember back in like uh, it was right after the the first avengers movie everybody kind of said well like now it's going to cause this issue of like well why don't you just call this person you know to fix your problem yeah. like why aren't they... this is the expanded version of that problem everything Mueller said is the is just the like the fully realized version of you have a, a universe that is not acknowledging its own existence right. so like Early on, they did a decent job of kind of keeping track of, okay, well, the reason why Tony has to deal with this by himself is because Cap is doing this at the same time. But then as it expanded further and further and further, now you can't account for everybody that's doing things at the same time because you can't put out content fast enough to do that. In you the could, comic you could, world... <laughs> Sorry, mm-hmm. Oniko. No, no, you, go ahead. I was going to say, just as a quick one, you could you could honestly do like a really fun little short film or something where it's like Hawkeye struggling with a really difficult local villain or something like that. And then like Doctor Strange just comes in and turns his, his fucking blood into like acid or something and yeah. just instantly <laughs> kills him. And then he's like, yeah, fixed it for you. See ya. Yeah, <laughs> like it's so- over in like five minutes. So like when you have like a an extended comic book universe with multiple writers doing multiple storylines as you go along, everybody's accounted for in that storyline because they're being written at the same time, released weekly or bi-weekly, whatever, whatever the schedule for that release is. The when you're doing movies and TV shows, you can't possibly pump out enough content fast enough to account for all of these characters in that year. So that's what like essentially that's when you end up with this situation of well, nobody's even acknowledging this because now this doesn't this hurts the script over here 
So we're just going to pretend it doesn't exist because it would actually screw up this script. But that's what they yeah. signed up for. And you know, they signed up to right. make a cohesive unit. I'm not saying that it's it's justified. I'm saying that's the problem they encounter and they create yeah. it themselves. It's just, yeah, it becomes exponentially more difficult the more complexity you introduce, the more characters, the more like organizations, the more factions, the more technology. It just becomes impossible to keep track of it all. It was so easy back in phase one where you just had a constrained group of heroes with relatively grounded abilities to some extent. Um, we had that. But yeah, now we're just beyond the ability to keep track of it all. It was a short-lived era because Age of Ultron's events like had an effect, and and at the end, I think they have like that little scene where it's like, "Who are the Avengers right now?" And they're like, "War Machine, Falcon, Scarlet Witch, uh, Vision, Black Widow, Captain America." We know that they're active. Then we have Ant Man, a film where Hank Pym explicitly says, "We can't get the Avengers involved because I don't want the tech going to them. We we have to do it ourselves." It's like, okay, I'll buy that. Next yep. film, Civil War. All the Avengers are in it. It's probably the biggest film in terms of actual fucking characters turning up outside of Infinity War and Endgame. And you, you can even whether or not the films are even like well written in, in in every regard, you can just sit there being like, okay, yeah, they're, they're all here, they're doing things, I buy it. But um, yeah, now in in Secret Invasion, for those who haven't seen it, when Fury's asked three different times in the series, where the fuck are the Avengers? He, at first, he says like it's um, they'll get copied, so we can't bring them in. The secret people, the scrolls, they'll look like I can't do that. And then by the end of the show, he's like, this is a personal issue for me. When it regards the end of the world, <laughs> it's like a personal, personal. issue. <laughs> yeah. And that argument yeah. alone is But is honestly, it seems like to me... But it seems to me that they wanted to get rid of Nick Fury, which is what they've kind of done with the end of this show, because Olivia Coleman's character is going to take over, I think, as the new director of... Uh, it's not called Shield anymore. What's it called now? Saber sword? or Sword? So Saber. I don't know. There's so many Saber, different right? organizations well, there. Yeah. She's going to the boss of MI6 and, I... and the SAS, right? She's got all the fucking accolades now. Yeah. Yeah, but I think that well, whole yeah. conversation she had with Amelia Clark's character, I think, I don't know, it sounded like to me now that she's going to be the new part of the new Avengers, I think. She's so <laughs> powerful. She's like more powerful than everyone now. Well, yeah, she's bigger than Captain Marvel and Thor and, and Iron Man and everyone else combined, apparently. She all the Avengers. Yeah. Like, yeah. why? Why create a character like that? Because <laughs> you're just, you're, you're killing your ability to tell a story when you have to deal well, with okay, that. It's like, well, she why. can do anything. But here's why I think they're doing that. I think the original series was written to be as interesting and attractive and engaging to as many people as possible which is why you know 27 movies billions and billions of dollars so many people showed up that's why we're still talking about it right that amazing um you know amazing uh summary that Mahler just did because it, it was so well made and it was perfectly done it had the heart it had the concepts that are everlasting friendship you know good versus evil all these great things and now i feel like the writers don't write for everyone that's why we hear so often people saying it's not made for you and it's it's intentional it's meant to be something that's divisive kind of like you know modern art it's like you don't get it you know you're you're not smart enough to get it and it's supposed to sequester people and only appeal to certain people who think that way and so why wouldn't you then have an extremely powerful female character that can literally destroy anyone and anything, and it only appeals to a certain type of female viewership? And it's perfect. Okay, we, we got that box ticked. It's, it's like it's meant to keep us out of it. Hmm. I actually think that the, the plot for uh, Secret Invasion was recycled from what was supposed to be Captain Marvel 2. That's that's been my thought all along. That it it it's pretty much a seek the series is almost run sequel to perfect to what Captain Marvel was. And you take some of the you, you just plop the Carol Danvers character in there at the end, and she can a lot of the powers and stuff, it all makes sense if you think about it. I feel like they just took an existing plot that they had for something else and just turned it as best they could into something else. And it they don't have skilled writers that can do that sort of thing. I mean, I, I think it's no coincidence this has come out when it has because it's in the lead up to the Marvels coming out. Assuming mm -hmm. it does actually release in November because that seems to be iffy at the moment. Yeah, exactly. but 
Um, well, he stayed 2025 is that eventually is what's going to happen. Yeah, I mean, I, I know they, they, if the strike's still going on, which it probably will be, then they can't promote it. They can't, the actors can't be um, on the red carpet or anything. So that might actually um, be a good thing for them. I, 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 I do sometimes think, like, generally with actors, like today, it's like the more they shut up, the probably the more successful the film will be. <laughs> Special, especially when it's pretty Larson. <laughs> Possibly, yeah. <laughs> like they actually uh, might release it. They might pump the release up early just so that way they can assure it happens during the strike. <laughs> yeah. I mean, her and Rachel Zegler need to, to tag team or something. You know, they'd be a hell of a combo. Unless yeah. we get Snock Lawson, that, like one time we got it. There's people like, oh, is this film worth seeing? And she's like, I don't know. What do you think? <laughs> yeah. was, that, was that the same interview where like they asked if she wanted to still come back? Is that the same interview? Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm thinking about. Like, oh, yeah, yeah. Like, do you want to come back? Me. I don't know. Do people want me back? Does anyone, Does want, anyone me? want me to still do it? That look <laughs> that she has, dear God, she but knows her, how much we hate her. All the time, people would probably like her for the like it would the the irony of how that would work. I could buy that uh, she considers this a big mistake at this point because it's been oh, no. a lot of years of not working very much. Yeah, yeah. I think she'd probably rather do like small like movies like room i imagine would be more in her comfort zone or in her wheelhouse the things that would interest her yeah, so. she's, she's learning what a lot of the actors seem to come to learn uh which is like take adam driver right oh yeah star wars oh and nowadays like get the fuck away from me star wars jesus well he also yeah. he, has that, he has that quote where he said that he only does movies like star wars because he really wants to do smaller projects that he enjoys but the the, the big money oh. comes from Star Wars project, so he can yeah. essentially fund his lifestyle of not getting paid to do the good the stuff he wants to do. I assume I assume that's why he took on sixty five because <laughs> that was a yeah. movie. I, watched, I, I watched that on a plane that's and it. I wanted a yeah. refund. And it was same with me it. actually. Yeah, yeah that was, that was, I that watched like it a, on a plane too. And anybody like a, does not want to pay for that. It's, yeah, it's like the only time when it's appropriate. It's like when I'm fucking stuck yeah. here for the next 10 hours. It's like, oh, I gotta watch something. Yeah. Fine, 65 that, that was, will do. That was one of the longest 80 minute movies I've ever seen. I was like, please just end. The pacing was so bad. I was like, no way this movie's that short. It's like, it is. Yeah, oh, I, was yeah. on, I was on a flight to <laughs> Las Vegas from, from the East Coast. I was like, okay. Uh, the, after that was over, I was like, oh, that mu I must be getting close to my destination. I switched over to the destination. I was like, I'm not even a third of the way there. How is that possible? I've been I've been watching this movie for seven hours. I don't understand. <laughs> uh, never time. It, it, it never it never got to the point of actually having a plot. That was the problem. No, there's no plot. Yeah, it's no, just that's, basic yeah. stuff. Um, it's it's uh, funny. It feels like it, it should have been made like 20 years ago when dinosaurs were still kind of innovative and cool. But like, yeah, yeah, mm. not now. <laughs> Um, I'll tell you what, it, oh. Oscar Isaac is probably the better example, at least, because he was passionately invested in Star Wars as an IP, and now he doesn't want anything to do with it. So, unless it's for money, yeah. which yeah. again, a lot of them seem to end up saying that. John Boyega is the same, isn't he? Because he he's been highly critical of Star Wars since oh, yeah. leaving. He makes Although it so horrible, horrible feeling. Like, want to come back, so. Yeah, I've got this horrible feeling they they'll throw enough money at him and he'll come back. Just don't do it, John. Yeah, he will not, not worth it the, to stand there screaming. He will not be on the posters in certain Take my so hand. Yeah. Uh, Race them. Tell you what, though. How about a nice little musical interlude? No. To lighten, our, lighten the mood and cheer us all up. I have to watch this twice because I watched it right before the show. Because I can tell Rob's excited for it. this. And I think it's about time we played it. Because, oh, uh, well, you know, <laughs> we're, we're fans of Star Trek around here, or some of us are. I'm trying to convert Mauler. I'm gradually getting there. I'm not really <laughs> a Star Trek fan either, but I can understand why this is extremely offensive to people who are. Yeah, well, have you ever imagined? I don't know how I can describe it. I'm just going to play it. Actually, this is this is what modern Star Trek is, everyone. That truly. didn't do it. It didn't, it didn't make it uh, fun. Boy, that's Gene, Gene Roddenberry would truly be proud to see what his creation has become. <laughs> I feel like silence is actually the only thing you can do with that. That's just. <laughs> I just I want to hear what Rob has to say about this. <laughs> He's uh, stunned. Uh, you know, the, the, here's the thing. Uh, 
I think it's very odd that Star Trek now as an entertainment medium has turned into something that only is self-referential. It only is about itself. Whereas when it was originally conceived, it was an action adventure, science fiction allegory that would deal with real world issues in a, in a entertaining science fiction action adventure way. And I keep, this made me think about the first time the Klingons were introduced in 1966 in an episode called Errand of Mercy. And they were originally designed as sort of Cold War Soviet villains. And in that first episode, um, the Enterprise rolls up on a planet that looks like to, it, it's stunted in sort of the Middle Ages. And the Klingons, the first time we see them, we see them as adversaries, but they're there at the same planet because it has strategic significance to both the federation and the klingon empire and the klingons come down to occupy this planet and basically set up a military government and our kirk and spock go undercover to to try and find out what's going on and thwart what's happening and at the same time the indigenous population of this planet really has no interest and they keep saying no there's no problem here and kirk and spock are like yes there are the klingons will execute civilians this is not a good thing and the indigenous population is like no 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 and then at the same time kirk ends up meeting Kor, the Klingon commander, as an undercover, as this character named Barona, and the Klingon doesn't know it's a Federation captain. And you learn about the Klingons through their relationship of Kor and, and Kirk conversing. And you really like the Klingons because they are smart, they are funny, they're cunning, they're really interesting. And at the end of the show, you realize that the indigenous population are really these incredibly powerful aliens that that are energy beings they're not even they don't even have a corporeal existence they just take on that existence when people show up to their planet so there's a really interesting science fiction story there and then these these energy beings say look uh we're not gonna let you guys go to war we don't believe in that and you actually have both kirk and core arguing you can't stop us from going to war and and it becomes we as the viewers like my god our hero is arguing for the right to go to war and these these energy beings the organians stop it all from happening really interesting science fiction story you re, you meet the klingons very interesting characters they're they're not cartoon villains you actually like them you admire them you understand their point of view and to see our main character have a interesting relationship with his counterpart essentially the klingon version of him so there are equals and it's fascinating and the Klingons were always, whenever they were involved in the original series, there was always a, a, a larger overarching story that involved them. To see what we just saw and how they have reduced the Klingons, I, I'm convinced that the, only, the people that write modern Star Trek, they came of age watching Buffy the Vampire Slayer, which they admit this whole musical episode was was mm -hmm. inspired by <laughs> Mom but, was just stirring somewhere in the background but, but the thing Nobody about had a lid from it the thing about buffy the vampire slayer was buffy the vampire slayer was a story about high school about coming to coming of age in high school it's just that high school happened to be built in a town that was over a hellmouth so you had the extra added horror fantasy elements but really it was still all about teen angst and growing up and and coming of age well, that's what they've turned Star Trek into. This episode with a musical, these musical interludes, it was about three romances that were happening on the ship and the end of those three romances. When has Star Trek ever done this? Whenever there was a romance on Star Trek, it was about a character becoming involved with an external individual, and there was some kind of a science fiction twist to it that was interesting and compelling. Now, Star Trek is Buffy the Vampire Slayer. It is all about the interpersonal relationships of the crew, which is a bastardization and a betrayal of the characters and of Star Trek as a whole. And when you see what they did to the Klingons, it's they're the butt of jokes. They're a, what a Korean boy boy band. They're BTS. What are they supposed to even be here? And I, I won't even because you know I don't want to be here for a million years. But when you look at something like this, you ask yourselves, and I would ask myself, or I'd ask the franchise owners, what do you think? of what they've done with the Klingons, even in this sequence. They don't even do something really interesting. I mean, the Klingons, we know 
culturally, they have a huge musical legacy. You know, we've even seen on various episodes of Star Trek where a Klingon crew will burst into song or sing an opera or something. And then to see this, which is the most, I mean, it's its the lowest of the low. It's such a, it's such, it's such low hanging fruit. It's not smart. It's just a one-off little joke that's only funny to, I don't know who. And I just watch this and it just makes me sad when we have other science fiction shows, whether it's The Expanse or Ron Moore's Battlestar Galactica or take your pick when they they go a long way toward creating a viable world that you can believe in. Well, my favorite word, verisimilitude, totally shattered by this scene. And I don't think Star Trek can ever recover. Why watch it after that? What does it have to offer mm -hmm. other than making fun of itself? That's all Star Trek has turned into a parody of itself across many different shows. And it's sad. I, I, I think um, when it came to Star Trek's vision of the future, there was a kind of timeless element to it because yeah. they, they never they never delved too much into pop culture of the, the 23rd century because they knew it would, it would come across as goofy and it would date it really quickly because it would yep. be whatever decades interpretation of the future. Uh, and so like when you hear characters listen to music, it's usually classical music because that's timeless, you know, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and it took itself seriously. Yeah. There was occasional episodes that were a bit more goofy or, you know, uh, what was it? Uh, the naked now or whatever in, in TNG where everyone's drunk and stuff. But like generally speaking, it wasn't a show that mocked itself. It didn't it didn't become self-referential, like you said. Uh, but something like this just smacks of we need a gimmick. We've, we've come up with a gimmick and we're just going to run with it because we can poke fun at ourselves. Um, and it just it dates it so much because even the musical style is so like current day. It's so contemporary. When someone watches this back a few years from now, it's just going to be like, oh, God, it's so cheesy, like even more so than it is already. Um, it's fourth wall shattering. You know, it it, it, it yeah. destroys the reality. Like you you would never see the magic Battlestar Galactica. Yeah, you'd never see Galactica do something like this. Uh, Ron think... Moore's version. Yeah, and I think with something like Buffy, okay, you can get away with a crazy musical episode like that because there was a fantastical element to Buffy already. Right. It's dealing mm -hmm. with the supernatural. And it was a show that had a kind of tongue-in-cheek um, emotional tone to it a lot of the time. And did episodes it like was... that a lot. It, you could consider it a gimmick episode, but the sad fact is that loads of people thought it was so good, because it was, that they decided to try and copy it when they don't understand, like... Buffy came up with a whole narrative for why it was even happening. It's basically a curse that's set by a demon that makes everybody uh, more honest about their feelings. His goal is to make everybody like cause complete chaos by having everybody admit how they actually feel, which they do through song. Different characters get exposed. Like some of the biggest revelations come from that, and it's all uh, written and directed with care from the guy who created the whole show. He wanted to make sure this was all very specific and very purposeful. You get all kinds of different kinds of singing. A lot of it is subtextual. And uh, mostly, the episode is one of the most tragic episodes there is. People are admitting oh. just how much they kind of hate each other and how much this is difficult. And some of them are admitting they don't even want to be alive. Like, this this stuff is, is heavy. And it, it impacted audiences heavily. It wasn't because it was a musical. It was a hell of a lot more to it mm. than that. It's such a yep. shame um, oh. that this has happened. So many shows try to copy Buffy for that when it was like... You, you got to work harder than just having it be musical. Well, and the thing is, yeah, there has I, to I be some depth to it at the end of the days. I, I think that's what is really, really missing too. Like, um, I'm going to just briefly go back to Secret Invasion, but you know, every time anything bad was, <laughs> anything bad was happening, you know, there was no true emotion. Like, even um, you know, his, you know, Fury's friend is dying in front of him. And he's starting to shapeshift back into a scroll, a scroll, which only happens when they're starting to die. And there's no reaction from him. Or, you know, uh, Amelia Clark's her father passes away. She finds out there's not a tear. She has that same monotonous expression yep. at all times. And what you're saying, Mahler, to have something like the if, if the basis of the of the interaction is that people are going to be more honest, then you're going to hear things that are very, that people have been sitting on and burying very deeply. They don't, they're not telling people for a reason. And that's, so it can be like the fun aspect of it where you find out that, oh, someone doesn't like someone. Oh, that's kind of funny, but also like, oh, they hate themselves. They want to die. Like those, that's, 
that's what makes a show good is that it can take something very realistic in an unexpected way and and draw on draw on your own depth of emotion pull you into it make you feel with it and Dr drinker what you were saying about the timelessness of tng like there's so many times i go back and watch that episode i think it's called drumhead if i'm remembering correctly but every once in a while i go and watch that episode because the lessons that that episode goes on about about how tyranny can just surface mm -hmm. in in moments of intense fear and how it can just take over and 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 create more suffering. I mean, that's such a timeless message that even even to, that's what we're going through today, right? Cancel culture is is based entirely in that. Yep. No, I just to, well, I was just saying. Mahler points out that once more with feeling is a a beautiful episode of television, and it's so well conceived and it works so well because the show itself is a supernatural fantasy but also a show it's a teen angst show and so those things work really well together and it's beautifully conceived and star trek was never that and what they were trying to do is take the buffy paradigm and impose it onto star trek so rather than make a star trek episode that happens to be a musical they've made an episode of not just buffy but a number of different shows where the central focus was about the interpersonal relationships of the crew. And that was never a focus of Star Trek. They would have an episode that might deal with something in a larger context, but the interpersonal, there was not ongoing interpersonal relationships in Star Trek. It, think, not really. Would well, you think that's what they're trying to do? In the, like, they've got a bunch of like 30, 40 year old actors pretending like they're, they're teenagers. Like they've got the emotional development that's a, of teenagers. It, it's exactly <laughs> what it is. I mean, Spock is Spock is a high school. Spock is Sheldon from Big Bang Theory, and that's that's all they know how to write because that's what they grew up writing. They do not know I, the the writing staff of current Star Trek does not know how to write Next Generation or the original series, and and I think because they they don't know how to write science fiction. What they do know how to write is what they grew up watching, which was Buffy the Vampire Slayer or Angel, or Big Bang Theory. That's all they know how to write. And so Star Trek is now missing what its essence was, and that was allegorical science fiction that had an action-adventure slant. They don't know the science fiction part of it. All they know how to do is write interpersonal... I mean, Spock is jumping from bed to bed now. He's he's the, the Lothario that, that they talk about Kirk being. And Spock, as a character wouldn't bring relationships, interpersonal relationships, into a work environment. He would not be tapping his co-stars or his co-workers or his shipmates. He wouldn't do it. But to pick, oh, I'm sorry. No. I'm sorry. Okay, to piggyback on that, you're, everyone's saying, you know, that they were influenced by Buffy. Like, I know that you mentioned that this was going to be, like, kind of a time capsule of its own existence, like, it's music from the era. I don't get that at all. I, to me, it looks like something from the late 90s to mid-2000s, and it seems like that's 100% accurate as to what you guys are saying, is that it's 100% them just writing what they want it to be like from what they remember. I don't... I, I feel like I'm watching, like, a commercial for, like, some product or something yeah. from, like, the 90s, like, the late 90s. It doesn't, it doesn't come off as current, even. It, it's, no. it's a time capsule of something that isn't even currently going on and that's that's that makes it even weirder in the greater scheme of things that they're it's a throwback to something that doesn't even make sense for what they're trying to do it's it's particularly disappointing for what strange new worlds was billed as because it was supposed to be a return to the tng episodic format of star trek where they go on a new adventure each week they're gonna you're going to encounter lots of like thought provoking science fiction that's going to like expand your horizons and really get you to look at things from a different perspective. Like what Star Trek was always meant to be about. Uh, and it was always billed as like, you know, this is the, the hopeful, optimistic one. That's how they, they kept using those words like all the time in the, the, the promos for the show. Uh, and when I see stuff like this, I just think, no, it's just, it's turned into goofy, um, self referential mockery of Star Trek. It's not the same thing as just being lighthearted. You you have to at least have, um, you know, when people say lighthearted, they want optimism. They want that optimistic vision of what humanity can be, but like crossed with some intelligent science fiction writing. 
but they're yeah. not getting the latter. You know, I keep thinking about there's a there's a great science fiction novel that I always go back to. I think about it a lot. A book called Blind Sight by a guy named Peter Watts. And in it, it's a first contact story about an alien race that is intelligent but not conscious. And we're unable to communicate with them. And this this me this it might result in the end of humanity. But the idea of finding it, it's such a compelling idea, and the way it's presented in this book is so strange and and interesting. And 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 you grapple with it. You don't start stop thinking about this. That's what modern Star Trek should be. It should be examining interesting science fiction concepts that that are sort of based in our world today. There's so many interesting things going on right now with humanity that could be great for any kind of an episodic show of Star Trek. We're not getting any of that at all. It's all Star Trek episodes are doing now is referencing other Star Trek episodes. It's bizarre. Mm. There's mm. no real stories. There's no real news stories where they're taking heady sci-fi concepts and grappling with them and having them reflect back on our world today. And it's strange, and I don't understand why. Is Do you think um, season three of Picard is going to be the last good Star Trek we get for a long time? I I do. I mean, I I, I do, and I I think that that and even look, Star Trek Picard season three. I really loved it, but it wasn't perfect. No, you know, it still was saddled with, but but it tried to further the Star Trek universe the best way it could, even though it had to deal with things that happened in Picard seasons one and two. But it brought back our characters and showed them in legitimately interesting places, uh, thirty years on, and and what does that what does that mean? And, uh, you know, I think that I would love to, if you look at Battlestar Galactica, Battlestar Galactica, the, re, the, the four season reboot, it never betrayed, whether you agreed with how it ended, it, it set up a, a, a situation, it set up a, its premise and its universe, and it never betrayed that. It never suddenly threw in a boy band, you know, and, and, and when it wanted to do something, it literally did an episode where we're all going to get in the boxing ring and fight. You know, that was a great episode. It's a, it's a <laughs> great, it's a great episode because within this situation, well, how are you going to deal with it? You're not going to sing songs. You're going to get in and settle your differences. You're going to put the gloves on. You're going to get in the ring and you're going to beat the hell out of each other because that's the kind of way you deal with problems in that situation. And like you said, great episode of television. That show was way ahead of its time. When I look back now, was that like 2003? The miniseries started. Yeah, yeah. Like crazy. That's 20 years ago. <laughs> Jesus. And that's what great science can fiction I, did, you know? Can I, can I ask you, as fans of Star Trek, what did you think of the reboot, the original movie? Not, I don't say original. The reboot movie with Chris Pine. What did you think of that movie? You just opened a can of worms. I'll let, you, I'll let you take this one, Rob. <laughs> you, literally, you opened up a can of worms you can't even begin to understand. Uh, again, I, no, I, I really disliked it because it, it all of modern Star Trek is like, if you had a pop culture sense memory uh, of what Star Trek might be that you just, you got through watching Simpsons parodies and you watched William Shatner on Saturday Night Live saying, get a life. All of it comes from that perspective. And JJ Abrams would say, if you go back and look any of, look up any of his interviews, he said, I never liked Star Trek growing up. It was too intellectual for me, too philosophical for me. So Star Trek 09, while I admit, love the cast, and maybe it's an entertaining watch. What it is, is somebody trying to turn Star Trek as a concept into what he wanted it to be, which was more like pulp sci-fi, more like Star Wars. And it, it has arguably the dumbest villain in the history of cinema. In that, yep, sure. the, the, the <laughs> villain, <laughs> I mean, the, the, the villain hero is pretty, pretty dumb. And the villain goes sure. back in time and, he, and he's mad because his home world's been destroyed by a supernova. And he goes back in time and rather than go and warn these people and say, you know, in 100 years, we're all going to die. He doesn't do that. He instead is mad at everyone and wants to uh, uh, visit his vengeance upon everybody by blowing up planets. And I'm, I kept thinking as I'm watching it, bruh, you could go back home to your home planet and warn everybody that 100 years from now, this supernova is going to kill you all. But now you have a hundred years to prepare and maybe prevent the supernova from happening. But he never does that. Yeah, you have a second chance. Li yeah. yeah, literally, yeah, literally every um, movie of the, the 
the new Star Trek is just a crazy guy on a revenge trip with a doomsday weapon. That that's mm. basically every movie, and yeah, it, it's the best way I can describe it. It's like it is just literally Star Trek viewed through the lens of J.J. Abrams. Yes, and, but, and, and Mueller, like you know J.J., you know what he does to movies. This is this is him. He works his magic on Star Trek. I'm pretty sure his rebooting of Star Trek is what like earned him rebooting Star Wars. Isn't that insane? Yeah, and yeah. It, it's just purely because it made a lot of money because they turned it from uh, an intelligent, um, thought provoking piece of sci fi that appealed to a relatively small core audience to a big bombastic action sci fi adventure. That's what he turned it into with like young actors running around, super energetic, super frantic, stuff exploding constantly. Um, <laughs> you know, don't think too much about it because we're moving on to the next scene. Go, go, go. That's go, all go, it go. is. Mm-hmm. It was weaponized yeah. ADHD. Yeah, it's it's JJ Abrams <laughs> rapid fire what stupidity. JJ Abrams is. Yeah, rapid fire stupidity, so you don't have time to question how dumb it is. You just move on to the next explosion and set piece. Uh, you know, Chris Pine with a giant sausage fingers trying to press the keypad because he's been infected with some weird thing. Yeah, all that stuff. It's just dumb. Move on. Don't think about it. Um, I, that, that's what the movie is, but it was successful for a time, but it's not memorable. No, and it has virtually no pop culture uh, presence. It left no footprint. Mm. People knew it, knew it got made, but nobody's Nobody goes back and talks about it. Yeah, I mean, like, for example, mm. Mauler, if I was to ask you, because you've seen one Star Trek movie, so, like, when I when I ask you about um, The Wrath of Khan, what does it make you think about, like, thematically as um, a movie? What did it Benedict Cumberbatch is what I think of. <laughs> <laughs> think, think about the original. Khan. <laughs> well, to be fair, because I, I don't know if you know, but I've seen the, the Abrams 2007 and the uh, Into Darkness one. Okay, so, so we can. It was interesting that I could. Yeah, I saw that one before I saw Wrath of Khan. So, how sad. Well, is I can that? ask you. Yeah, well, I can ask you then. So, if you, uh, Wrath of Khan, what did that give you to ponder as a viewer? Oh, fucking plenty, really? dude! It's a really, really, really good movie. It's cool to watch a movie that's got such a high reputation and it can live up to it. It's uh, when because I was joking just then, like it completely replaced any memory I have of um, Khan as a character from like Jage's attempt at it. Now I think about like. What is essentially one of the stronger villains I've seen in in any kind of context that relates to Star Trek. Granted, I haven't seen a lot of it, but of course, you're show- I assume you want to show me highlights, not just uh, every single villain that ever came across. But yeah, it was. Um, we, we we for anybody who doesn't know, we have a commentary about it. So if you want to know like two hours of me and Drinker's thoughts on it, it exists out there. But it was. How can I summarize it other than saying um, it was a super engaging, very uh, well reasoned, and quite a terrifying while simultaneously um, endearing sort of force to be reckoned with that did exactly what we were just talking about with the mu- musical with Buffy. It convinced people like J.J. Abrams, we got to get a guy who's angry and revenge and he has to have a history that everyone fucking is angry, blah, blah, blah. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's, it's sad to see it stripped so bare that you're like, oh, that's how that happened because everyone likes Wrath of Khan. Well, also, that's like every yeah. modern movie just uses the the somebody on a revenge trip like formula nowadays. Yeah, it, it, it's it's not mm. just Star Wars and Star Trek, and it's just every movie across the board is a revenge tale anymore. Well, and, and as well, I, I direct you to the the budget of this because I'm pretty sure um, Wrath of Khan was like twenty million dollars or something back in the day, which is oh, it was less crazy. than that. Less than that, yeah. So you're you're talking maybe fifty million in today's money. Um, versus like the new trek movies which were like 150 million each at least uh and like they have like one one hundredth of the the artistic merit in terms of what they accomplish that's i don't know i just think that's interesting (laughs) like listen i have to jump out i i'm sorry i I only had an hour but uh i want to thank you for bringing me on this impromptu panel baggage claim dark hour mauler it's been great to stream with you i will watch the rest of this as i have to go to my meeting but um thank you for having me thank you rob it's an absolute pleasure to have you on as always man thank you and and thanks for for that shout out again on the russell branch that was very sweet no problem all right thanks man (laughs) cool um yeah i mean What's that? <laughs> I said I'm larger now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it might go to your head. Be careful. <laughs> I don't think my head can get much bigger. <laughs> um, the other little thing I was going to touch upon was um, the, I don't know, 
you guys are too familiar with The Witcher and how it's been doing uh, this season, but it's been a bit of a disaster. Um, and it's sitting at about 20% on Rotten Tomatoes in terms of the audience scores. It's that high, so really? Absolutely, yeah. It's fallen wow. off a cliff, unfortunately. No, that, 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 um, seems, that seems a bit up there for it, actually. It does, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's a show that's absolutely self-destructed over the course of a few seasons, like just three, really. And I'd be highly doubtful if they even get a season four at this point. But, uh, you know, the, the showrunners and um, producers behind it have been talking about it recently. And one of them shared his thoughts about um, why it is the way it is. Uh, so if you bear with me a second, this quote comes from Forbes. It was an interview with Tomek uh, Baginski. Uh, so a producer on The Witcher, um, he said that, uh, <laughs> trying to explain the style that they went for with this, when a series is made for a huge mass of viewers with different experiences from different parts of the world, and a large part of them are Americans, these simplif simplifications not only make sense, but they are necessary. It's painful for us and for me too, but the higher level of nuance and complexity will have a smaller range. It won't reach people. Sometimes it may go too far. Um, but we have to make these decisions and accept them. Basically saying that they simplified um, The Witcher because they didn't feel like American audiences could handle the, the level of complexity. Um, so it goes on. Um, what's, uh, yeah, the audience changes. It's not like um, I see uh, the processes that they wrote up in... Uh, sorry, that the author wrote in his book after the script, uh, we resign from cause and effect change and from linear narration. Uh, this book, like narration, when it comes to shows, the younger the public is, the logic of the plot is less significant. The interviewer asks him, what is significant then? And he says, just emotions, just pure emotions, a yeah. bare emotional mix. Those people grew up on TikTok and YouTube. They jump from video to video. And the interviewer says, you're talking to such a person right now. And he says, okay, it's time to be serious. Dear children, what uh, you do to yourself makes you less resilient for longer content, for long and complicated chains of cause and effect. So essentially saying, The Witcher is made for young people and young people are dumb and they live on TikTok and they can't handle complex narratives. Now this is coming in the, the wake of, well, what do we have? Game of Thrones, House of the Dragon, fairly complex narratives on the go there. Um, yeah, that's... It's a pretty arrogant way of looking at your audience. I mean, what <laughs> happened to the push and pull of you, even if this was true, right? And to be fair, especially with my recent interactions with the uh, Twitch reactors, I found that like audiences, maybe they are a little, uh, you know, they jump from thing to thing real quickly. But what happened to the whole idea of like the market does react to what people want, but also provides things the market didn't even realize it wanted. You know what I mean? It's like, hey, mm. people, check this out. And you're like, I don't care about this. And you watch and you go, oh, maybe I do care about it. Okay, yeah, this is kind of interesting. You know that? It's, instead of being like, ah, fuck it. Emotions everywhere. I don't know. Well, it's a pretty it's a pretty dangerous road to go down as well. Because if you go on that basis, um, you are just going to endlessly dumb down whatever you make to the point where it's just a bunch of random uh, colorful images playing on screen with lots of sound uh, just to grab people's attention. Then it means absolutely nothing. Um but it doesn't matter because it's like you've successfully held their attention for the length of a TikTok video, and so that's good enough. Um, is that is that what you want your art to be? Like I thought no. they would aspire yeah. to something a little bit higher than that. I'm sorry, I'm American. Yeah. I wasn't paying and attention. It... Yeah, <laughs> it's just like uh... yeah, Drake, Can you put that? On yeah, TikTok? it's going over our yeah. our American that heads. Was, it's just that going was way over. Too long. Fifteen seconds was the most I was going to listen to you talk. All right, I'll distill it down. Then, like, how <laughs> dumb do you want your art to be? You know. <laughs> I mean, there is a, a dumb art good. Like, yeah, <laughs> there is. I think anybody can kind of separate themselves in that. I mean, assuming you have any level of thought, you can have your your things that you want to think more about, and then you can have your dumb fun over here. They don't necessarily have to cross over. Like, you don't need to take this series that is. I don't know how many Witcher novels there are. I know there's three games. I know it's a very deep lore. Uh, but you don't necessarily need to take this incredibly complex thing and try to boil it down to for stupid Americans and young people who like TikTok. Uh, you can make it, and it has an audience. It has lasted this long for a reason. Let it be for that audience. It's fine. Maybe you will pick some people off from a different, like a different, you know, group as you go along, and someone will catch it and be like, they're like a Henry Cavill fan, 
and they're like, oh, let me check it out. And oh, I, it turns out I actually do like this. I'll look further into it, which is really the way they should have went with it. And it seems like they went, they took the exact opposite thought process on that. I mean, the, the, there seems yeah. like a high degree of cope with it as well. Like we, we basically mm. changed a bunch of stuff from the books and like nobody liked it. So it's clearly their fault. It's not our fault. There's that, yeah, there's, there, there's that too. But it's this, it's this weird thing that, you know, with the rise of TikTok, there's this assumption about the general consumer, but they ignore what's also happening in tandem, which is the rise of long form podcasts, which are, I mean, yeah, there's TikTok and then there's Joe Rogan, who's like the most, you know, watched podcaster ever. And it shows that people are willing to spend three hours and listen to something really complex with diverse thoughts, diverse concepts, and explore ideas that might be hidden from them, right, in other, in other places. So this assumption that, oh, we should just go for the lowest hanging fruit and try to get attention from teenagers who probably are not interested in this anyway, versus how about just going for a more sophisticated viewer, which is the general viewer, I think. It's like there, there are things teenagers do, and then there's content that 30-year-olds want to watch, 40-year-olds want to watch, 50-year-olds want to watch. But it's this, it's this desire to constantly go for teens. And I don't know if there's this insecurity that these writers have. Like they want to be looked at as cool, which is why they would put in that kind of, you know, dance number in a Star Trek, Star Trek series. Like why not just do something that is for your age group? Like the, and I'm talking about the writers. Why do you need to dumb things down for kids? When did they become they, like running? Why are they running everything, every piece of art? I think it's because every production company puts such an emphasis on a, a younger demographic that the writers just kind of get into this whole like, well, I have to appeal to that. That's to keep my job. I have to do this. I have to do this. And there's like, it, it's not they almost treat it like it's the only demographic, whereas there is other ones. It's like, yes, they're smaller demographics, but, uh, or maybe less, less important demographics, but they are still exist. And it seems to be that they just get forgotten because the production companies make such an emphasis on this particular one. Yeah. Um, Stream killer. Sorry about that. <laughs> it's like, like point wah, made. Wah. Point made. I'm done. I'm out of here. See you later. Yeah. Uh, no, I, the, it's funny. I was just looking there for the 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 quote from the showrunner as well, but um, why they decided to structure the show the way they did because um, there was a much greater focus in this show, particularly seasons two and three, on Yennefer and Siri than there was on uh, Geralt, who's the main character. He is the Witcher in The Witcher. Uh, and you'd think that would probably make him the focal point, but apparently not. And um, <laughs> the, I'm paraphrasing it slightly, but there's a quote from um, Lauren Hithrich, who's the showrunner, who basically said, like, the, the, the fantasy genre is not particularly um, female-centric. It never has been. And so I wanted to see myself represented um, within that because um, it's, it's not something I'd gotten to see in the fantasy genre before. Uh, and so I made the decision to focus more on Yennefer and Siri, and basically take um, screen time away from Geralt in order to give them more fleshed out characters and more uh, more plot to to occupy them. Um, which is an interesting choice because he was essentially the thing that was selling your show, um, mm -hmm. and I think it makes a it makes for an unusual decision to minimize your protagonist in in his own TV show. Um, yeah, I, I think uh, I think Gary had done a video just recently about this, um, where they tallied up the amount of screen time that Geralt gets, mm. and it, it amounts to something like twenty percent of of the actual screen time in season three is devoted to Geralt. Damn. Whereas the the rest of it just goes to Ciri and Yennefer, uh, which is a shockingly low amount for the main character, <laughs> um, and it probably explains why want... Henry Cavill left. <laughs> But if you want f women to tune in to a show like this, if you want to attract that audience, we love Henry Cavill. He's like, the fandom around Henry Cavill is incredible. People find him so charming. So he's just like, he. people often cite him as the perfect man. And yeah, he's so attractive. There's, 
Like, there's have him more on the people, show. I mean, he is well, yeah, a people, huge people crowd are, that follows him around with a puddle right after it. So. Yeah. <laughs> people are people are correcting me here. Sorry, 16.9%. So I was miles wow. off. It, so God. it's not unheard of to have sections of your show that, like, this episode focuses on this person, this episode focuses on this person. But to, you always generally bring it back to the main character. You don't. I mean, I, now I know that there was like the whole he, the fallout with him going on, uh, which probably also they're probably like play, downplaying that aspect of it, like and saying like, oh, we're, you know, we were doing it like this because this is what we wanted to do, but it might have also had something to do with that. But you usually work your way back to the main character after those pocketed episodes about somebody else. So it is a little yeah. strange in that, in that thought process. I think he was very much like an unwanted passenger for most of the show. Like they, they didn't particularly want him there. And I think on a, from what I understand on a personal level, like the, the showrunners and the writers didn't get on with Henry Cavill because he was questioning them. Yeah. Um, well, wasn't there that like the... quote where he was like, they wanted him to have like a sex scene and he was like, no, it's not in the book. Yeah. Something like that. Like, so it's like, I, he was clearly not gelling with what they were trying to do. Yeah, well, he was actually having to beg them for more lines at times, apparently, because he's like, "Can I please do something in this episode?" <laughs> nah. I don't, how is yeah, he how, getting? How sad is that? How, yeah, how is he getting mistreated left, right, and center when he's so popular with audiences? I like, the way he got know. kicked oh, out of no. Superman when he was like a great Superman, and it's just, it's so weird. Like you have I talent on your hands, use them. I, th I think Superman was just bad luck because I think they came from two different directions. Superman was bad luck. He he, you know, was mishandled. They did they, they didn't know what to do with his version, and they couldn't get past the Zack Snyder curse. No, with The Witcher, I think they straight up just didn't want him in it. Um, they didn't like the fact that he knew the lore better than they did. Um, mm. They didn't like the fact that he corrected them on stuff and no. like, was fighting to to maintain accuracy. Um, I yeah, he just became a pain in the arse for them, which is yeah, it's such a shame because if they'd worked with him, he would have been their biggest advocate, and yeah, it would have absolutely yeah. endeared them to the fans. But instead, they decided to go to war with them and force them out. And it's like, well, now you've essentially killed your show because nobody wants to watch it without him. You um, but with Justice League, how is it possible that he's been kicked out, but then they're keeping Gal Gadot? Like, how are they? I don't know uh. if you guys know more about that. Like, what is what is the plan? I mean well, you see, I they're mean, only keeping the greatest of the acting talent in their pool. <laughs> <laughs> she does look really good in that suit. So I, I mean, she, she that, does look good. I, I opted not to say yeah. that. So. It's just when she has to talk and like emote and stuff. That's where things fall apart. Hello, no. <laughs> yeah. Hello. So bad. Uh, I I I, I, I didn't think there pretty. was many people who could put less emphasis into their like you know, inflections than me, but apparently there are. <laughs> I, I can't wait to see her as the evil queen in, in Snow White. Yeah. Because um, that a character like that, I I would assume, right, if <laughs> I was going to say it's not going to be about the looks, but in her case, apparently it is. But like, they have to be charismatic as fuck because you're a villain. You know, you have to own the screen when you're the antagonist and we'll you, gotta, you, you have to ham it up, especially when like you're playing off of a mirror. Like you need to really ham it up in those instances. <laughs> yeah, I just I don't on think the, there's enough going on there. I think as part of the quote you were mentioning, by the way, they, they said like they want more. They want to see some female centric fantasy, right? See myself in there, get get that going. It's like, how many times are you gonna say that's the reason behind it without acknowledging like, did they watch Willow? Did they watch Rings of Power? Did they watch? I mean, did they even? acknowledge that like uh what's called blood origin was essentially that too and it's like you won't be able to pull this card forever if you keep making them because i assume what they actually want is a female-led female-centric sort of fantasy thing that is successful yes that's what they that actually is yeah. exactly what it is you hit the nail on every fucking head right there <laughs> i mean all these are gonna get forgotten you know in a year's time when someone says like oh, i want to see a female-centric fantasy you go what about willow they'll be like <laughs> No, I... it was the same thing with comics, though. It was like we wanted they wanted to see a successful female comic character. It worked with the first Wonder Woman, and then it kind of like just started being bad. It was, it's like, okay, it worked that time. So let's just keep going. Yeah, what was the the other quote? It was, um, 
I, it might have been Rachel Zegler talking about Snow White, where it was like, uh, oh, she's not. Uh, it, it's not going to be about romance. It's going to be about her yes. wanting to become a leader and stuff. And, and leader. Um, that was the red carpet. It's not 1930s anymore. Yeah, yeah. And it, it's kind of like it, it's uh, it's really about her own power. Um, and it's funny they keep using that word power all the time now. It's weird. Um, mm. But anyway, um, yeah, it, it's uh, postmodernism is all about power. Everything's about it, it, power. It kind of seems to be, it's just like, the, you know, when a certain term or a buzzword or whatever just keeps floating to the surface from yeah. multiple people at the same time, you're like, is this some kind of weird push that's going on right now? I don't quite get it. Um, but yeah, like when you when you hear stuff yeah. like that, it's like, um, okay, you're you're acting like this, this whole idea of like a, a self-actualized empowered female character is like some crazy new concept that we've never heard of before. Like it's essentially been at the core of like every Disney production for the past ten years now. Like, how many more mm -hmm. times can you keep pushing this as a new idea before we just say no? This is this this is the status quo now. You know, there has to be a new idea beyond that, I guess. But um, no, that's how it gets marketed at the moment. Eventually, we'll um, get to the point yeah. where it's like, oh, we got to really start pushing male pan fancy like power fantasies. Yes, yeah. there's just not enough I've of those out there. I'm gunning for a Ken movie. I want to see it happen. Yeah. <laughs> I did so, nothing but that's wrong. the same thing with Barbie. There's something that's the same thing with Barbie too, right? Like it's completely devoid of the concept of love, right? Like Ken thinks that he should be in this relationship with her because it's because he's typical Ken and she's typical Barbie. And there's no room for romance. Stereotypical, there you go. Uh, not typical. Uh, but there's no room for romance or love and that's why you don't really see that between any of the characters even that brat of a daughter that she, barbie has to talk to her parents oh are like it, they're like asexual friends in the way that they talk to each other and the only like with a lot of these modern movies the only love that's really allowed seems to be self-love like you should be mm -hmm. high-fiving yourself and be really self-obsessed and really into yourself or into promoting other women and and uh you know like raising them up and telling them how awesome they are so friendship is fine female to female but any love between a man and a woman seems like a very antiquated idea now i mean i get i i can sort of get the the message of you know you need to learn um to find who you are to to um you know to explore your own like desires and stuff in life and uh, and find out what you truly want to be which is fine as a, a first step but then it has to lead to something else like you can't just stop mm -hmm. there and be like well i love myself now and that's all i need in life me <laughs> like you know you need something else you need to, someone to share it with like you've got to go beyond that and it's like yeah a lot of these movies don't want to take that step because mm. they, they seem to equate being in a relationship with someone to being somehow dependent on them or owing them something or being chained to them. Like they see other people as some kind of uh, millstone that drags you down. Um, yeah. You know, instead of something that like, like lifts you up, like gives you more motivation to be a better person. It's, it's an odd. But it comes, it comes back down to the postmodernism idea is that the belief is that every relationship according to postmodernists is based on power. And there's one person that is imposing their will on the other. So that there's so their belief is there's no such concept of free will, love, where it's a mutually joyous connection. Instead, no, it's usually the woman is being subjugated by the man. So that's the whole their whole perspective on marriage is that it is a power play where men benefit from everything and women benefit from nothing. Hmm. And well, yeah, it's a weird thing to teach people. Like, if that's your young, impressionable audience, to teach them that, like, how are people ever meant to get into relationships, or are they meant to, or are they just hmm. go out, become a wage slave, work in some cubicle office for the the next forty years, <laughs> and just be become miserable? a leader, a girl yeah. boss, become a leader. <laughs> yeah, it's such a yeah. There's sperm banks for a reason. Yeah, I mean, yeah, again, it's a strange thing to tell people that you need to be because the majority of people don't want to be leaders, not because like, mm -hmm. not because it's bad or anything, but like it's just not their proclivity. And it's like you're you're kind of almost teaching them, well, if you don't become a, a leader of people, if you don't have people under you following you, then you're somehow not measuring up. You're a failure. 
but that's again that's that's not a, a realistic standard for the average person to to aspire to it should be something more fundamental than that that's what i guess that's what stories that's what movies fairy tales whatever you want to call them used to teach people like finding fulfillment in other ways like it's not now yeah you know? yeah find fulfillment in the products that you can buy <laughs> that's pretty much it our products Yay, will offset your cripple yeah your crippling loneliness <laughs> it's fine like it's it's like all the stuff that they said in fight club you don't want yeah yeah that's basically what it is that the classic dichotomy of like yeah. modern society is like working a job you hate to buy things you don't even need or want yeah <laughs> but yeah it's, it's framed as a good thing in in that movie it's a it's a really interesting choice i suppose um but we do have a bunch of super chats here that have been piling up so while we've been doing this um would you guys be up for answering a few yeah if we this, can. Is my favorite. this is actually my favorite part because it's always like a surprise like, what is, right. well what yeah you never what's, it's the, always what's a the topic to gonna turn into yeah <laughs> who knows um blank face says i know i'm early but you're already late and gay well jokes on you because we were only a couple of minutes late so and the gay might... part was intentional yeah we're only <laughs> gay because we're kens for the night you know what can i say john smith <laughs> says barbie is the birth of a nation of our time <laughs> he also says get what girl broke is a cope barbie smashed a billion it did i mean we can't deny that it made a billion dollars there, there is anomalies in life though <laughs> yeah, I mean, we we were talking more quite uh, and dark hour actually when we were on Movie Cynics um, stream a couple of nights ago, theorizing about how successful it was and why. And you know, there's various theories going around. I think the marketing was fantastic for it. I think mm -hmm. um, it gave women like a movie that was just straight up tailor made for them. It wasn't like, oh, hey, you know, there's a superhero movie that's traditionally male oriented, but like it's kind of for you as well. Like this was just straight up. No, it's Barbie. You know, this is the thing you played with. It's un unambiguously female. This is a movie for you. Maybe that's what got them in. I don't know. Yeah, well, they could like dress up. Yeah, and they were like, people yeah, I could. You, you know, everybody dressed up, and it was it was like a fun thing that you could plan with your friends. Like, oh, let's all get dressed up and go. We we don't like we don't get opportunities to do that, and like we enjoy that. And I think the other part of it is that it did actually hit the mark on of adequate escapism because it was cool to see Barbie land and all that. And that the, the woke messaging was not as pernicious and obvious as the other art art that tends to be made right now. I think it, it wasn't as on the nose. Like, I think people could ignore it and like put it away and say like, ah, let's just keep watching. It's, it's like, it's a popcorn movie. Let's just enjoy it and move on. I think when, once you got past the first 20 minutes and they go into the real world, it starts to become a bit more obvious in terms of the messaging. But yeah, William Hayes kind of summed it up well. It's like you've had like probably 100 failures of movies like this where you've had one that's done massively well. Like, does that like disprove the trend or is it just an anomaly? I don't know. Well, that's the thing. As like, someone who doesn't really go with that as a trend, I think the people who point it out, I mean, you know, people have done this with me, right? It's like it, superheroes are on their way down. Then Guardians of the Galaxy 3 comes out and it's like, ha, you were completely wrong. It's like, what do you mean? It's still trending down. Everything's yeah, like trending one, down. What do you mean? One, <laughs> one thing doesn't, yeah, one thing doesn't change the trend. Um, and I also think like we, we are so attuned to it. Like all of us here, we're commentators on, on wokeness in movies, right? So we pick up on it so much more than other people. And I saw this in how other people might like, friends who are not as plugged into this all because they're not thinking about this all the time their perspective on them was like yeah it was a little woke but it was fine like they, they didn't it didn't hit as hard whereas for us we were so we're like finely tuned instruments on this now so we pick it up all the time hmm. it also did a really good job of undermining its own message which helped like it like it constantly made like made points that were antithetical to what it was trying to actually say so it like offset itself a lot of times yeah because uh, the end messaging was that it's oh you should you know can't i just be regular a regular person do i have to be a boss bitch right that was like the end all message i was like i just want to know i i walked out with about 15 minutes left to beat the traffic so and it wasn't i'm sorry <laughs> a movie theater i'm so. sorry i ruined i ruined the ending for I, you. I, I, I'll, I'll survive <laughs> i'll survive don't worry yeah <laughs> I should have warned was, you. <laughs> the, the the weird the, yeah the 
the final message seemed to be almost like, well, you know, it's less important about fighting each other and more about like just accepting yourself and learning who you want to be. But also, women are on top. <laughs> like that was that seemed to be the, the, yeah, that, the that, that last it. little bit is it? It's like, yeah, we're all the same, but girls are better. Yeah, it's like, it like yeah. that little like muttering yeah. under the breath at the end of every argument. That's kind of what it is. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Martha is asking open bars a day early is in this economy. Oh uh, yeah, we wouldn't normally do this obviously, but uh, I'm not going to be in the country. Um, Liquor tomorrow, is cheaper so. on Wednesdays. Yeah, I'd say so. Um and Josh Noble, so many couples are going to dress as Barbie and Oppenheimer for Halloween this year. Yeah, I want to see the guys dressed as an actual like atomic bomb. That was fantastic. <laughs> That'd be I great. Pink shirts though, so I probably have to dress as Barbie. Yeah. Uh, Normie <laughs> says the Barbie sequel should be called Barbie 2 The Wrath of Ken, but make it R rated and very gory. I think I think we can make that work. You know, since I for, since I didn't get a chance to do this because I wasn't on that stream, hold on. Oh, what's gonna happen? Okay. <laughs> yeah. There we go. Dark Ken. Dark Ken. There you go. <laughs> Superb. <laughs> uh Waylon Bicephus says, a bucket of AIDS or stuck for 10 minutes in a cage with dark hour staring at you menacingly. And then with a crazy look in his eye, he says, let's get it on. <laughs> I'll take the cage with dark hour. I mean, um, <laughs> I mean uh, 15 years of fighting and I have never injured a person. So like, like I've hurt people, but I've never injured someone long enough to uh, put them out. So I think you're so in they, safe they, hands. They could always walk home at the end of... Yes, yes. That's one thing that I've always made a point is that I don't make it... I, I always remember that people have work the next day. That's so fair. I, don't want... <laughs> I would say that's reasonable. Uh, Stephen Bobo says, I know the panel and the chat don't like Ethan Klein, but give the man his due. He whoops uh, XQC's candy ass in the debate about copyright and the transformative media. I mean... Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, on on the basis that Ethan Klein can actually form words. So that probably puts him at an advantage, I would say. Definitely gave him a head start on the whole conversation, yes. Uh, next one is Waylon Pacifist says, film a Kraken or <laughs> Munch Makuchi. <laughs> he has, like, I love every single one of the, like, super chats that guy comes up with he's i know it's just like he must he must spend all day planning these he's just got um, a book full of of like like pun names that he could just go through it's fantastic yeah kenwa says hail panel question for you drinker and mauler is a show with campia a possibility would be interested to see a change of pace and a must see rmb hook drinker up so could we have john campia on this open bar i don't think he'd accept that invitation and i'm totally it. crazy <laughs> I don't think he'd be up for it. But he's welcome to come on. He is, yeah. We would have we'd happily have him on. And I think we'd give him a, a nice cordial reception, don't you? Yes. Yeah. We're nice like uh, that. We're reasonable gentlemen. Uh, JS Pena says, have fun in Houston. I won't be able to come, unfortunately. Just a heads up since you'll be downtown. Watch yourself because it's very progressive. Okay. <laughs> I'm more concerned <laughs> about the heat than the, than the progressivism. Yeah, the mel uh, the melting to the blacktop will probably be the thing that we're that's worse. Yeah. Than the so if I stand too long in one place, where my where my trainers just like melt to the the blacktop. <laughs> well, like I said backstage, occasionally that you have to like in southern states, you have to move your car because the the literally your tires will melt to the to the the street. Brutal man. <laughs> uh, Waylon Bacephus says, "What's your favorite race?" Mine's the Daytona Five Hundred. Uh, I'll go for Le, Le Mans. The Le, Le, Mans? The, Le, Mans Le Mans 24. I there's guess actually, it's no, so actually there's, long. One, there's one called the, uh, I think it's the 2.4 hours of lemons. It's like a five, you, your car can only have a value of $500 or something like that. And you have to like make it last for 2.4 hours of racing. It's like, wow. It, it, yeah. It's actually like, well, it's basically a parody of the Le Mans. So like that's that probably idea, my actually. favorite race. Just racing absolute fucking shit tips of cars. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> like, it's trying like to keep people have, like remove the seats and put like like um like milk crates in that they're sitting on and stuff just to get the value down. It's fantastic. <laughs> uh cirrhosis of liver says, Congratulations on your 25th video on organized chaos's channel. <laughs> Here's wow. to hoping he puts that money towards a speech coach. <laughs> Good luck to him. Well done. <laughs> 
Uh, the ghost of Drinker's Liver says, not sure which is more frustrating, hearing how Netflix completely fumbled The Witcher or putting up with all the Old Spice tie-in ads. Um, yeah. Okay. As a so user point. of Old Spice, I, I approve. I, I used to love the Old Spice ads. You know, that the really charismatic dude who was like mm. riding backwards the, on a the horse. The man your man could smell were, like. Yeah, they were great. I love them. Um, Kyle Kernan says, Mauler, what's your top three One Punch Man characters? Oh. Well, is it so one punch, punch man, one punch one. man, and one punch man. Yeah, <laughs> kind of, but um, hmm. No, two. It could be Moomin Rider. He's pretty cool. Um, oh, I do like a lot of the characters in that, but I've got to settle. It might be generic at that point because I'm going to want to go for um, uh, Genos as well. You know what? I'll need to rewatch it to give you a more detailed answer, but I'm going to settle for those three. All right. Northern English Bastard says, How did you get here, Dark Hour? Ha ha, happy to see you on here again, mate. Uh, drinker, everyone else, keep up the good work. There probably go. those, it's probably that USB full of uh, blackmail photos I have from Tatiana. Yeah, well, there is that. <laughs> he threatened to put me in a cage match as well. So I was like, Yeah, nah, <laughs> yeah it was either, that was a choice. It was either fight me or I'll, I'll release all your dirty secrets. Yeah. Uh, Tyler Wolf <laughs> says, Hey, baggage claim, loved your last few videos. Thank you so much. Uh, Blue Collar Loser. That guy sounds familiar. Says, Drinker, thanks for the 1K <laughs> subscribers. Almost at enough watch hours for monetization. I'll send you my first YouTube check, lol. Uh, dark Hour again. I'll <laughs> pretend that I like him. Oh, Ooh. screw you, buddy. <laughs> 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 nah, I love that guy. Me and, me and Blue Collar Loser have streamed together a bunch of times. Uh, he's a great guy. Uh, yeah, no, he's a good guy. Um, Waylon Bicephus says, the shootest or Unforgiven? Now, this is a tough one because I, I like John Wayne, but I feel like Unforgiven is probably the better movie. I adore Unforgiven. Uh, I have to agree with movie. that. Yeah. The shootest is a great movie, too, though. They're really yeah, close. You, They're really close. I think it's should, really just uh, an era thing. Yeah. I mean, Mauler, just out of curiosity, you should watch The Shooters sometime just because it deals with very similar ideas. Um, and I think it'd be interesting to see, like, as a, a much earlier prototype of Unforgiven almost. Be quite cool. Yeah, yeah. Uh LC Le Pen says, Good day, open bar. Drinker, hope your trip was great. It was, thank you. Uh Mauler, good on you for tackling the return of the React Wars. Man, those debates deflated my brain. Yeah. It's it's been it's intense. Once per year, okay, you need to be it's like getting a vaccine or something to this insane like <laughs> you gotta get inoculated. It, it's like uh well yeah it's like Chernobyl you've got to limit your exposure, you know. Um, Chuxenhausen says, Hail chat, drinker. I remember you saying you watched Tulsa King. Have you reviewed it yet? Uh, no, I haven't reviewed it yet, but I very much enjoyed it. It's a good show. Um, Casey Boyd says, Mauler, who's your favorite full metal, al sorry, full metal alchemist character? Ooh, man, I haven't watched that show in so long. I can't remember who my favorite, I think it might be Armstrong, and actually, funnily enough, both of the siblings, so to speak. Um, mm. I really like. Yeah, I'll just go with both of them. They're fucking great. Uh, Chuxenhausen says, "Shout out to Dark Hour. Congrats, my good friend." Thank you. <laughs> I have not one. Uh, <laughs> uh, Casey Boyd says, "Are we sure you, we're not taking the Barbie movie too seriously? All my female coworkers <laughs> thinks it's just satire and hilarious. I haven't seen it though, so I can't chime in on it yet." Um, I think it's just interesting because it's made so much money. It's been such a crazy success story. Um, yeah. It's kind of interesting to ponder why. I mean, every show is still talking about it, so that's that just goes to show you, like, yeah, how it is. it's been what uh, out for like three weeks now, and people are still are still talking mm -hmm. about it on their weekly shows. Yeah, uh, Zitra Statnis says, "I still think Johnny Law would be a great addition to this panel." Well, wow. one day. Um, Casey Boyd says, "Shoe on head said that tea is gay coffee." As Brits, when are you going to declare <laughs> war on her? What makes you think we haven't already? Yeah, we've sent people to deal with her. Yep. Um, <laughs> don't worry, we'll get her on the right track. Uh, anyway, uh, Thomas gave us two euros, so thank you. Uh, what's this? Why Vernados says, question, what do you think is Christopher Lee's best uh, casting or acting role? Saruman in Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings or Count Dooku in the Star Wars prequels? I don't think it's that either our, of those. I was going to say, is that our <laughs> only choices? Because like he's he's been in like a million Hammer horror movies and he was great. Yeah. <laughs> like, I mean, he well, was and, best and, in Dracula. 
Also, is it just me? But choosing between them is pretty easy. Not because like he's a great cast as Count Dooku, but I mean the writing is kind of like you know. It's, you know. Yeah. Trash. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Just his voice. Just the way they used his voice in Lord of the Rings. It was like a p perfect use of oh, his yeah. talent. Yeah. Um, yeah, I feel like he's the kind of guy who could command a landslide to happen on a mountain just through the sheer force of his voice. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> it'd be too. It'd be too scared to like say no to him. <laughs> um, but I also yeah. love the behind the scenes where he's describing to Peter Jackson what it's really like when you stab someone in the back because he's yeah. clearly done it before. World War II paratrooper and all that. It's well, and um, yeah. dude. that he was like a liability on set because everyone would just want to listen to him talk. People yeah. would like surround him, listen to him tell stories and stuff. <laughs> it's like, God damn it, we're I mean, gonna make yeah. a movie. When, you, when you've him. done basically everything in your life and you've been around for about 80 years, you know, it's just, you're going to have a lot to tell. Like, I'm yeah. sure Rob has said to us, like, he recorded hours and hours of interviews with him when he was working on the wow. behind-the-scenes stuff for Lord of the Rings, and it's never been seen. Uh, you'd okay. be fascinated to see what was in that. Mm -hmm. hmm. uh, such a shame. Uh, Grimnax says, now I know Drinker is far too drunk. He started the stream a day early. Well, that's true, <laughs> but it's better than starting it a day late. Um, or a week late. Tom, yeah. Thomas says, I finally got to see Oppenheimer. Terrific film that didn't feel like three hours at all. I also got to see Florence Pugh's boobies, but not Florence <laughs> Florence's poopies. Okay. I don't think anyone else needs to see that, but okay. Um, Mahler, I know you've finally seen Oppenheimer. Is it possible to press you for an opinion that doesn't last for several hours? I have not watched it yet. Okay. I know that sounds weird. <laughs> But I, I literally good. had it booked. I had it booked, and I had to get out of it. I've not. I've been up and down in my health, so haven't watched it yet. Don't say anything. Uh, it's actually, well, I've I've noticed that there's a, there's a lot of people who I've dealt with, not only in the YouTube sphere, but in like regular life, that haven't seen it yet, and it still has done so successful. It, it's yeah. a little weird that that's happened because, like, usually when you see a movie that successful, you're like, everyone's seen it. It's like it's it's strange. Yeah. Um, yeah. I... Yeah, more like is it is it redeemed Christopher Nolan a little bit for you? <laughs> I mean, it's, I think it's yeah, it's it's a breath of fresh air from him in terms of there are certain choices in it. I'm not sure I'm totally bought into the whole um, black and white versus color, objective versus subjective, as I think he described it. I'm not fully convinced if that was necessary, um, <laughs> but like it's uh, the rest of it. Like I think that he made incredibly good directorial choices that supported the uh, the story and the journey the characters were going through. And I feel like, funnily enough. The film was so focused on Oppenheimer as a character that I almost missed out on being like, hey, can I find out more about the bomb, how it was made, and more maybe mechanical aspects? That'd be neat. Um, but, you know, I, I guess I'm not <laughs> I'm not against the idea of finding out as much as I could about each of the people involved. And uh, I think, am I right, Drinker, in saying that you felt like it, it went on for a bit too long in the third act? Yes. So actually, I, I probably my preferred part of the movie is the third section uh, <laughs> i agree with drinker but i understand where mauler's coming from on it that there was some really awesome parts of the third act i just feel there was certain things that could have been trimmed down and and tightened up like so it was a really weird situation where because some of the things they said were just reiterating things we had already seen so you didn't really need them you could have yeah this this was my big issue whereas you know when they dropped the the bomb on japan Spoiler baggage claim. They they did that um, twice, actually. Yeah, twice. In fact, yeah. Um, but yeah, the, it, it leads us to the, the the questioning of like, well, was it worth it? What's the moral implications of doing this? And um, what have we unleashed by creating this kind of weapon that now other people are going to strive to replicate? And it's like, okay, fine, that's a, a very valid question to ask at that point in history. But then you you skip forward to the end of the movie an hour later, and you've essentially you end on the same question. Uh, which just makes me feel like that's a little bit redundant then if you're having to circle around to where you were an hour previously. You know, I get that it fills in a lot of the gaps like historically in his life and stuff and, and gives us context for what happened to him. But yeah, like in terms of the, the payoff to it, it just didn't feel like it was quite enough to justify all that extra runtime. We well, weren't anyway. going to get a definitive answer to that question, right? It's kind of the nature. Well, of I don't. No, I don't need. Uh, yeah, I don't need an answer to it. I just mean like the the movie can end on that question, and it's perfectly valid. Like that's a good way to to leave you questioning the morality of all of it. Um, but if you just end on the same question that you were posing to the audience an hour earlier, I don't feel like you've achieved 
necessarily that much in the space of an hour. Um, I mean, the, the additional context added to the question that Oppenheimer and Einstein, uh, how much am I allowed to say here? Because I don't uh, <laughs> like. You yeah, can, you're, yeah, I know. I know. I know what you're referencing. Yeah, like what they end up, what we discover, they talked about. I feel like that changes the paradigm, especially after the whole context of the film of exactly what you believe the effects of the bomb had on the world, well beyond the actual like bombing, more so on the mindsets and approaches yeah. to all kinds of dynamics going forward. And I, I don't know. I, I feel like the film suitably just po poses it to us as like, you're in the future. What do you think? How do you think the the world benefited or? had detrimental effects of this having been created and what did it do to all these institutions and all the people that run them and um, you know how beyond it goes from Oppenheimer which I feel like they really did a good job of highlighting in contrast to Strauss right the whole uh, he's like they're talking about me they've done something to me he's coming after me and then like the majority of the points are just like dude he's not even thinking about you like yeah at all. it's bigger picture stuff whereas he, yeah. he's very dialed into his image and the smaller picture yeah, yeah, which is a fun uh, contrast. I like that. Yeah, no, that was that was that was pretty good. No, yeah, there's yeah. definitely there's definitely stuff they could have trimmed down though. I think they could they could have got this down to about two and a half hours, and it would have been it would have had the exact same effect. So I, I agree on that. Yeah, you could have done that. Yeah, um, but overall, like it's my god, it's like it's definitely a worthy movie of watching. Like it's definitely worth people's time. Oh yeah, hundred um, percent. Whatever flaws we we found in it, it's uh, it's miles better than most of the stuff we get these days. Um, Ethan Rackham, I think this is referencing what we talked about earlier. Stop letting Little Platoon on your channel. His editing is weak, but he's dethroning you as the best critical. You should adopt uh, Hasanabi mindset. Next super chat. Uh, to not let smart people near you, just have Grace Randolph, Stockman, Ben Shapiro, <laughs> Mahler. I know you can dominate them just like you wow. dominate the drinker. <laughs> wow. Well, if you don't want smart people near you, then I'm I'm your guy, so... Can, can we have Grace Randolph on open bar? That would be amazing. I am on board with that. <laughs> Might have to mute her. For no, most we, of it. You, you can't. You can't advocate for Platoon not to be here. That's my. That's my boy Platoon. Come on. Yeah. No. <laughs> uh, Platoon's great fun. We're gonna have him um, twice as much now. They're gonna yeah. literally have him. He's. They're gonna set it up so he can have two sections of the stream. He could probably do it because he's a cartoon <laughs> character. Yeah. Canon <laughs> Folderall says, got a notification open bar was starting, briefly panicked and thought I'd slept through Wednesday. Congratulations on 60 years of streaming excellence. Cheers. <laughs> We're just doing this to mess with people's heads. That's all it is. Uh, Terrified says, Drinker, if you don't have a director for your short film, you could have Mahler do it. Uh, it may take 10 years, but you know every detail will be looked at thoroughly. <laughs> it's called a true. short film. It's a short yeah. film. It can't be Mahler. I, I thought to send him the script, but then I knew he would just absolutely destroy it, and I would hear from him in about three years with all his detailed thoughts. Well, how, yeah. My novel Actually, I will to, be ready. I three about years. that trigger. Like, I guess because it's a short film, you're allowed around the the strikes and stuff. I don't really understand how that works. Well, it's because it's filming in Canada, so we're using Canadian actors, and so they're not uh, the, the so strikes. Screw, don't screw to them. the American SAG. <laughs> yeah, well, it turns out Canadians can do American accents, so it's it's acceptable, you know. Um, and a lot of the characters are like Russian and stuff as well. So yeah, they're they're close enough. Yeah. Um, so it's worked out fine for us. Um, it worked out even better because there's a whole bunch of like um, you know, valuable like camera equipment and stuff that's not getting used right now. So we we can just uh, appropriate not, it and use it. Not only that, it might come out during a time where nothing else is coming out. You might this this might be the greatest thing that ever happened to you. I mean, this, who this knows? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it won't be ready probably until the new year, I should imagine. But um, yeah, but yeah. like, there's going to be delays on everything. Yeah, so there'll be the knock-on effect. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There, you, so, it might come out in a nice lull where it could get a huge wave. Yeah, who knows? Um, how, how are you aiming to release it? Just out of curiosity. Um, I mean, we'll see. Like, the YouTube's obviously a good option because you know we've got a couple of million people who can who can potentially watch it if they're interested. So, not to mention um, the fact that you have people, you'd have like all like your like everybody who's on YouTube that appears on Open Bar would be in the chat talking to people. That'd be pretty cool. Yeah, so it's kind of like <laughs> um, this is like a proof of concept to show that it can be done and and show what we can potentially do with like a relatively small budget. And it's like, well, okay, if we had a bigger one next time, what could we accomplish? So. Yeah, we'll see what Very we can nice. do with that. Yeah. Um, Terrified says, Drink oh, no, sorry, I just did that one. Uh, Story Arc Welder says, Thursday came early. I'm not complaining. I like it. And uh, yeah. Yeah, it is early. 
Asher's brain pan says, I've been trying to work through the difference between the neutral mass character and the strong female character. So far, it's down to the character arc. Thoughts? So what's the neutral mask character? Yeah, I don't even know what that first one is. Not sure. Uh, Hold up. So neutral mask character is a learning mask, which is not designed to be used on stage. Unlike expressive mask, the neutral mask does not express a specific character. He represents a generic character without internal conflict, but able to express all the diversity of our emotions. All right, so it's like the tragedy and comedy masks that you get in, in theater then. Okay. Or one that's neutral? I was thinking, like, yeah. as you explained that, I just thought video game character that doesn't have, like, choices. Like, like, a, like an RPG character that you make their choices for them. Like, that's what I thought. Yeah, so... Uh, yeah, so he doesn't have an internal conflict, but he can show the range of emotions. So, I mean, that, that's kind of on par with the strong female character in that they don't have a conflict um, except about learning to realize how awesome they are, so... Like yeah. Literally, the first thing that came to mind was fault, like like Fallout Three, Fallout Four characters, where they don't really, depending on what you choose them to say, they show a different emotion, even if yeah. it doesn't make sense with the previous statement. That's just that's usually just bad game design. Um, Roger Rubio says, "I volunteer to watch over the critical doggo while you're away at the conference. <laughs> don't worry, the doggos <laughs> will be taken care of." Uh, Kevin Medina says, "If you need an extra for your movie with a bullet and a mustache, then I'm your guy." I would like to have some kind of like Spetsnaz Russian Special Forces guy with a mullet and a mustache just so he's totally out of place. That would be awesome. Um, so CBGB's says, Hail to the open bar. You guys are awesome. Any chance you can wish a happy birthday to my husband uh, and fortune and glory. He's had a rough few years with a career change and your content has kept him laughing and sane. Cheers, guys. We can absolutely do that. Happy birthday, man. Hope you're having a, a great time Happy of it. Happy birthday. Fellow Leo. My birthday wasn't that long ago either. So Nice. Uh, GJJ says, welcome to Houston. Only one billion degree outside. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking forward to it. 102 as every day you're there. I'm, I'm sure I'll be about 20 pounds lighter by the time I come home. I'll just like sweat it all out. Um, <laughs> Par Party Alm CV says, parasites aren't animals. They're just parasites. Fair enough. Okay. Um, Wes Van, Van Katz says, who do you think is the most evil villain in cinema? Skeletor. He just <laughs> fucking loves being evil. <laughs> oh, Palpatine. He's, he just he's wants to bring so order to the galaxy. Oh, Harvey on. Weinstein. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Behind the screen, really. <laughs> <laughs> what, did, what character did uh, Christopher <laughs> Lloyd play in Who Framed Roger Rabbit? Because he was just straight up yeah. evil. I don't remember the name of the character, but that was yeah, a great character, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> just remember him. You just love being evil. Uh, back then and back again says, you guys are awesome, and advice for channels is excellent. Just got my first uh, video out three days ago, and it's already at 100 views. Wish me luck, and thanks for mm -hmm. all that you do. Congratulations, yeah, man. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Probably out basically really my well. most recent video, so you're good. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Big Dave K says, hey, Critical Drinker and Company, I'll finally be sending you an update this week. Random question. Have you ever seen the anime series Made in Abyss? No, no. I haven't. I don't know anything about it, I'm afraid. Sorry, man. Looking forward to your update, though. Um, and Axel's Abode says, I'd like to shout out Dan Morrow on YouTube, a great reviewer and box office analyst, 150,000 subs. Ex honest trailers writer and movie fights champion, well rounded channel would make a great guest. Dan Morrow sounds familiar, actually. The name, yeah, he's heard a that Green before. Junkies guy, he's a part of them at least. He was a cap right. all the time, I think. Oh, okay, cool. But yeah, um, got his own channel now, obviously, and um, apparently he's really good, so very nice. Maybe we'll get him on sometime. Um, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna call it, um, call a halt to the open bar fairly early tonight mainly because i got to get up super early for my flight tomorrow so um much as i would like to keep going for another hour i'm, I'm gonna have to get some rest at some point um but i just want to say thanks to you lovely panel for coming on tonight appreciate it um dark hour baggage claim it's been a pleasure to have you back on the open bar uh likewise with rob um and Mahler, i i tolerate you yeah <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for uh, having thanks, us. 
Thank you. No, it's been awesome to have you guys on. And thanks to everyone else who's joined us tonight um, for this slightly impromptu open bar. Uh, thank you for your generosity and for your awesome super chats. Um, and any ones that we missed, we will catch up on as we always do. But um, for now, at least, I guess that is all we've got for today. So we're going to go away now. Bye. Bye. <laughs>